Today's episode is brought to you by CBDLion.com. You got anxiety, joint ache, having a hard time sleeping? I use CBD Lion only. Been using it for a year and a half. Use the code DEAN for 20% off. The best CBD on the planet. Family owned. Third party tested. This is not your truck stop bullshit. This is clean, real deal CBD. They even got gummies that are vegan now. Check it out. Get your tinctures, your topicals, your hemp flower, all of your broad spectrum products, even pet tinctures and treats. My little Gertie dog, she's all over these CBD pet treats, and uh, I can tell she sleeps like a queen on them. CBDLion.com. CBD makes you feel fine. Get your CBD. Right now from cbdline.com, use the code DEAN. All right, here we are. It is a Monday. I'm a little slow getting the episode up. I've, uh, I don't know. I'm in a funk. And it's amazing how powerful, like, a mediocre set can have. I've been, I've been doing pretty damn good during the, uh, covid comedy doing comedy at all these pop-up shows and everything and and diving back into it but once in a while you'll you'll get hit with a bad set it wasn't a bad set but it was just a medium set and it's like a snake bite man the venom goes through you and it's been just fucking lingering on me for a couple days now i can't believe how strong that could be and i think it's just because i I love it so much that when it's not up to what I, you know, feel is, uh, you know, up to par, I, uh, I get bummed on myself. So it's, uh, been a, just a dreary couple of days and, and I know what happens. It happens to me. It used to happen about every six months or so over the 11 years of doing comedy You just start doing too much shit and then one of the things you're doing takes a hit, whether it be podcasting, comedy, or or anything, writing. So, you know, I'm at that point where I'm like, God, I got to get back on stage. I got to dive into these bits and I'm, I'm just being fucking hard on myself because I'm always trying to to get better and the shit happens no one's perfect i've seen all the kings have uh, mediocre sets that's what happens but when it happens you uh you think you can shake it off you're like yeah bad set oh well but nah that's just the facade you go home you linger in it and uh so yeah that's what's been going on with a mixture of just dark cloudy day and i'm all oh here's some fucking depression (laughs) better grab the cbd lion that's that's just uh that's funny but anyway this this episode has cheered me up because i went back and listened to it last night and it's kind of it's kind of made me kind of happy for being a california kid born and raised in california growing up in one of the most insane rock and roll eras of late 70s 80s into the 90s all the way to now right now but uh my guest today josh richman he is uh, a lot like me 100 percent rock and roll he lives it he breathes it and he he also has lived his life by his own rules early child actor was in river's edge Natural Born Killers, Thrashing. He's done tons of TV, 21 Jump Street. Booming, doing all that. Then, bam, switches gears, produces and co-writes Don't Cry, the Guns N' Roses video. Whoa, all of a sudden he's, he's in the video world, hanging with Axel in the, in the heyday. And then switches gears into the biggest club promoter, 
probably that Hollywood has ever seen. 20 years in the game, 20, 21 years, something like that. Had one of the greatest clubs I ever hung out at, Camaro, which was at the Viper Room every Monday night. Talk about rock and roll. And still doing it right up until COVID. No idea where he's going to go next, but it does not scare him. He's, uh, he's a man that just wakes up each day and sees what the world brings. And what a fucking guest. This man has 10 books in him. Let me tell you, 10 books he could write. He was there. His club was the ground zero of the Paris Hilton Nicole Richie, Lindsay Lohan era, all of that. When I first hit Hollywood, it was just kind of, uh, you know, it, it was unreal. It was like something I'd never seen. So you are going to enjoy this episode. And uh, once again, I do want to remind you about my brand new podcast network, Cactus Radio. And it's cactusradionetwork.com for all of the new podcasts. We have the Mark Marin and myself, Dark Fonzie Show, which episode one is out right now. And uh, then we have the At Home with Byron Katie. Episode one will be out tomorrow of that. And then the Grail and Let There Be Talk. So, yep, grinding my ass off, just trying to, uh, just trying to get somewhere out there, friends. Thank you for your Patreon support. We had a good little uh, Zoom fest last night. That was fun. And I want to give a shout out to the new Patreoners, Michelle Sizemore and Mel Strong. Thank you so much. And everybody else that's been there for the last couple of years. I love all of you. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey is where you find it. Also, next weekend, Alameda Comedy Club in the Bay Area. There's a few more tickets that have been released. It was all sold out, but they moved the shows indoors. So there's like 20 tickets per show left. And uh, get in it. I'm going to come up there and attempt to uh, make you guys laugh. Bay Area, yes. Alameda Comedy Club, May 21-22. I guess that's about it. I guess that is about it. I can't wait for you guys to dig into this episode. It is a great, great ride. We go from the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s. And man, it is fun. Candles are lit for Josh Richmond. All right, here we are. Another episode of Let There Be Talk. Oh, fuck, this is going to be good. Old friend, Josh Richmond. How are Hi. you, dude? Hi, Dean. I'm great. Thank you. <laughs> For those about to talk, yeah. fuck, we salute you. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, I was going to call it either for those about to talk or let there be talk. Either way, it's fantastic. Either one, either one. How are you, bud? I'm pretty good. I mean, I got to say, I almost feel guilty, you know, during this crazy time in our culture and our life of having a good life, but I'm not going to apologize for it, you know? <laughs> I mean, I will say, like, main job, that that went away, don't care, you know, kid can't play with as many people as, as we need him to play with and learn with, but that don't matter because I get to spend great time with him. I mean, the truth is, it's, it's hard to complain. Now, I know there's a lot of people suffering, but it's, it's hard to complain for myself. When you ask me how I'm doing, I'm doing great. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. 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 Right. It's, uh, it's almost like this weird thing of, uh, if you survivor's are survivor's guilt. Yeah. 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 Right. You're like, Hey, I, I, uh, how are you doing? Eh, I'm all right. You don't want to be like, fuck man, not bad. Like what? Really? <laughs> but I also think presenting a positive thing in the wake of such negativity is also good. You know, if a little bit of positivity can catch on and other people can be like, yeah, you know, I'm not doing so bad either. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And plus we've just also dodged a huge bullet in that election in November. Yeah. Yeah, we did. <laughs> that's like a huge, like a, that's like a massive exhale. It really is. It really is. And um, mostly like I say this all the time, I don't care what political side you're on, but we, if, if you're just promoting uh, hate and anger and insanity, then that's just not good with me. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, that has to go. 
Yeah. The red, the blue. Yeah. It goes back and forth. Fine. It's a ping pong battle. I get it. Fine. But but that that was that was a horrible catching our entire country in its processes with its pants down. And we ate it for four years and we had enough. And that was nice to know that it's the first guy to get blasted out in four years and who, since anyone can remember and for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh it's great to have you here. I've been wanting you on the show for a long time and of course I was on the road all the time and you're swamped and here we are. Uh perfect timing. Uh mutual friends of course. Uh Victor and Joy over at uh Tacos 1986 who That's I had on the show. Spot, yeah. Yeah. And I think back to really my early memories of you um is I remember you more than you remember me because you and I start really kind of hanging once uh, Fred comes around. Sure. But I remember you way back in the 80s and uh, the GNR days. And uh, I was there, you were there. And it's, it's amazing to think about the California that you and I know, you being 56 or 55. 55, 55 <laughs> but you and I, dead on same age, dead on into a lot of the same stuff you're a sports freak me minus that but i just remember seeing you forever um you Who were your now because i think we probably had this dialogue when we sort of became friends actually through durst and we were working together and hanging out a lot but i remember i'm sure i asked you then because you were there and like this picture you just showed me you know you look like you're cut right out of the cloth of what we all were back then and who was your crew of people? Who, who were like when you were at Bordello and Cat House and these places, who yeah. was your running squad? It was mostly the Teeman. So Howard Teeman. Oh, okay. Right, right. And he was in he was in that crazy band. The Apes, Sam yeah. Man and the Apes. Yeah, yeah. But they were Howard all, was a sweetheart. He lived up in Laurel Canyon. Yeah, yeah in yeah. the in the mansion that Rick Rubin later bought. And made the system of down records. And the chili, chili peppers, peppers, yeah. And then Genesis P. Orridge, who's now dead, like burned it down. Right. Oh yeah. no, it's still there. Well, no, it was. Yeah. There was a huge fire. Right. Rick sold it. Um, I always wanted Rick to make that into like a bed and breakfast. Did Rick sell it? Yeah. He. That's no longer his. Problem. Somebody grew plant the uh, the like Hedges. brush. You can't see in there no, no. at all now. Yeah. It, and I walked it. You know, it's funny. Uh, there was a kid that moved out. Well, he didn't really move out here. He was spending a lot of time out here. Total rock star. He hadn't made it yet. Became an actor, pretty good, and now a huge rock star. A kid called Machine Gun Kelly out of Cleveland. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Colson's his name, and everybody calls him Kells or Colson now, whatever. But when I met him, when no one knew who he was, really, except his own really loyal following, and it was, uh, he was so earnestly like our friend Tall, who I'm sure you know Tall. Yep, absolutely. Tollywood. I'm, um, Tall was like, Kells, you got to meet Josh. You know, Josh did this, and he's come from this, and he knows all this. And, you know, this earnest kid was like, you know, the one thing in L.A. I really want to see is uh, that house in Laurel Canyon where Rick Rubin made those records. So yeah. I called Rick and his assistant, Dave, and they set it up. And I, and I just took, I took Kells over there. It's right up the street from where I grew up and where I live now. And we walked the, we walked the property and just talked about rock and roll. And, you know, these, these, it's just interesting the things about, like you're saying, coming from this, coming from here. And when you talk about like a body of work and career, my career to me is coming from the Hollywood Hills. Right. Whatever movies I was in or videos I made or shows I've done or clubs I know, whatever, that's all fine and dandy. But the truth is my career is I'm from this mountain right here that sits right behind us to the south. Yeah. From where you stay out here in Studio City. So it's like that was, an, that was a funny watershed moment to me in a way that like a kid who was like loving all this stuff gets his feet in the ground from Cleveland, and the one thing he wants to see is that mansion. And I was like, wow, you know, that's, once again, three minutes from where I grew up, three minutes from where I currently live and where I exist. And I think one of the things that's most sort of prideful to me is the fact that I am sort of an ambassador and a denizen of this thing where, you know, the world looks at the, at the, at the byproduct of everything we make out here. Yeah. whether it's music or art or rock and roll or whatever, the world is always looking at what's coming out of Los Angeles and Hollywood. Totally. And, and, and it's great that you say that um, in this day and age of people are constantly hitting me like, yeah, you're going to get the fuck out of California. That place is fucking your, your governor and your fucking, yeah. and it's like, Hey man, uh, politics aside, uh, born and raised in California, you know, you're, you're telling people, uh, which you've never even been, you probably live in, you know, Oklahoma or wherever you live, Wyoming or whatever, and you're knocking something. Uh, at the meantime, 
You love rock and roll that's come out of here. You love TV and movies that you watch every night. And then you just shit on a place that you haven't been. But the heart and soul of this state is definitely right in here where we're at in about a, a 10 mile radius, no, which I, is wild. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think there's been some, obviously some fantastic stuff in the Bay area as well. Of course. And they merit, uh, they merit major inclusion and even a little bit in the South Bay and whatever, of course, punk rock and stuff. But you know, I, I will say that most of the people that talk shit, they're talking shit about people that aren't from here that yeah. moved out here and acted a fool or whatever. But like, they don't know people like us that are from here. That's a big difference. Yeah. Meet someone who's from here. Now, are, are there, we can cuss? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, so are there fuck-ups? Yeah. yeah, there's fuck-ups yeah. who are from here, of course. But in general, you meet a, you meet a down dude or, or, or woman you know, who's from here, they got, they got soul and spirit and heart, and maybe they grew up in Hollywood and moved out to Topanga, or maybe they grew up in Topanga and moved into downtown L.A., whatever it is. You know, I just think a lot of the bad stigmas don't have a whole lot to do with the people that are actually from here like we are. Yeah, like, you know, I'm from the Bay Area. Uh, so California, born in Yosemite, raised in the Bay Area, and then here. Been down here since the 80s. Oh, yeah, yeah, just making music, playing gigs nonstop, you know. So ca California is just in my soul. And, you know, I lived in New York uh, for on and off three years over the last few years. And I love that too, but this that is, is a whole other beat down. That's a whole an, another animal. <laughs> and I do love New York as well, but, yeah. but man, that is, yeah. you know, we got, we, you can be out here and you can be on top of Mulholland and Laurel Canyon on top of a beautiful mountain and watch a mountain lion roll by. And in, you know, in 35 to 45 minutes, you can be in a desert or a beach. Mm -hmm. I don't know who has it like that. It's gorgeous today. It's January 88th or whatever it is. Yeah. And it is gorgeous out today. It is. And I'm sorry, but like seasons are great. Yeah. They're great for your soul and your psyche. But the truth is, I'm fine with it. I love yeah. how today is. I don't want to be braving the cold in New York and like <laughs> it's freezing and I forgot my glove and I lost my hat and I don't know. I like this, so I'm fine with it. <laughs> we, had, we had about four days of winter here this year. Well, there's something about this city that is in our blood and if you look at it it's like skateboarding uh op shorts bmx you know what i'm saying I'm just all saying things i've talked about in the last three days right all of which right all of which i was there for the evolution of same my here. aunt in new york who yeah. lived in the upper west side called them my op shorts she's like you're wearing those op shorts <laughs> i loved op i and had you know, the, the, the the only skate shop in the day, in the day, this is almost like pre-vertical, pre-skater cross was yeah. Val Surf, which is literally two minutes from where you live. It's not there anymore, but that was this place where you went and got your, your hookup. Yeah. Now you go down to Brooklyn Projects on Melrose and look at Dom and you get your yeah. setup. But yeah. like, but, and, and, you know, it, these things that we were a part of that were counterculture that yeah. became completely normal. To every single kid has a skateboard, even if they don't skateboard. When we grew up, it wasn't like that. No, you not skated at all. You or you didn't. And like, you know, yeah. if you didn't, you got hurt. Like, if you didn't know what you were doing, you got hurt. Early on, you're growing up here, and you decide what, you want to be an actor? How do you get, because you were in River's Edge, which is a goddamn masterpiece. I agree. And I ended up doing a film 100 years later with uh, Dennis Hopper. And I think that from Easy Rider and River's Edge and Blue Velvet, I was like, I love this man more than anyone on earth, and I still do. He's gone now. But, I mean, just in the two months I hung with him, it was mind-boggling. So let's talk about your, uh, your, uh, how you evolve. You're going to high school here. What happens? Well, you know, I will say, just to touch on River's Edge real quick, you know, I, Keanu is my family, and Crispin Glover doesn't really live in America anymore. But, you know, over the years, we've all discussed that, like, it's – very rare to be in a movie that's that great. Oh, God. And by the way, Keanu has been in quite a few. And even in like with Back to the Future, Crispin has, you know. Uh, but I will say that like to be part of something that's that fantastic. Oh. You know, you don't even you don't really know it when you're doing it. You know you love it. And you know, when you're a working, young working actor, you just want to get a good job and a good movie, right? You know, of course, Keanu came to town and got all my jobs. So he relegated me to a to uh, <laughs> what I call Milo the offbeat buddy status. <laughs> what role are you playing, Josh? Well, I'll be Milo the offbeat buddy in every movie yeah. and every show. Yeah. So yeah, um, I'm the weird neighbor. That's right. Yeah. So, or I, the uh, town racist. 
Yeah, I mean, I never got to be that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you know, to be in something that's that fantastic, and I have no problem saying it. Like, oh, fuck I've also yeah. been in some things that are unwatchable, but but that's a, that's prideful. You know, when we were talking about skateboarding. I was in Thrashing as well. It's still the only skateboarding movie. I mean, everywhere I go, the world over, I get stopped for Thrashing way more than River's Edge. Thrashing is, and it's Josh Brolin before he became one of the great actors walking on the planet, and and every great skater. That, that the whole foundation was built on and I'm super proud of that too and at the time it was cornball still look, killer though but you look back now everybody has got it they've got their beat up VHS of it mm. they've got their burned DVD of it they know all the lines and I get a lot of love for that so it's like rad except that except that nobody cares about rad right like everybody loves thrashing because Hasoy is in it and Alva's in it they're right. all in it anyway so and the Jacks from up in San Francisco were yeah. all in it oh so, yeah so at the end of the day getting back to your your, your question I was a I was a voiceover. I had I was a child star on the radio. Oh, really? I had done three hundred voiceovers by the time I was about fifteen or sixteen years old. Just morning ads or radio ads? You know, I don't know. It's my father's company. My father, who was in sports, uh, you know, his come up was in sports, and then he he started he. The long story, but he started the Seattle Supersonics and was the first general manager of that basketball team. He did. So he took his his beautiful wife and his two little kids out of Laurelwood, which is in in Mulholland and Laurel, essentially. Went up to Seattle. There had never been a pro franchise there. And my dad took the money that was you know the, the the foundation money and was the first GM of the Supersonics and did it for a year and a half and came home. And when he came home, he started writing Rap Patrol. Farmer's Daughter, Leaves Beneath the Daisies, Man from Uncle, all this episodic TV. And he found himself, he met a guy who was uh, uh, like a guy who was a big radio guy. And they started, they just, they had this sort of creative thing. They were writing really creative commercials in the late 60s and uh, early 70s. And so as they started to kind of blow up, you know, they kind of, they kind of broke the mold. They were doing, they were using kids and doing things that when, you know, you're on the, listening on the radio, they were like jumping out at you. Yeah. Re- real life things. Like it felt like little movies, you know, they, they were really good at it. Um, and I was, I was a little boy who could mimic. So I had this funny post nasal drip and they pulled me in the studio and I'd mimic the lines. And all of a sudden, you, you know, this little kid with a post nasal drip sounds like this. And then he's saying all this funny stuff and he's three. So wow. I've done about 300 of those and won tons of Clio and IBA awards, which I knew nothing about what that meant until, yeah. until Mad Men came out. Um, you know, the walls of the office were lined with them. I didn't know. It was normal to me. So I did that. I did that. And then, you know, like drugs and degeneracy yeah. takes over. And like, you know, my voice changed. I, I had done Christina Applegate, whose mom, Nancy, went out with Stephen Stills. Whoa. Okay. Christina was a little itty bitty kid. And her mom, Nancy, was a voiceover person, too. And when Christina was itty-bitty, she and I did Kmart photo processing national ads for years and years. She still talks about her first house in Laurel Canyon was the house Kmart built. Wow. So when I got to that voice, that time when they thought my voice was going to change, they banked like a couple years worth of ads. And my voice didn't change, so that was good. Yeah. But, you know, so I, I, I didn't know any different. I, I was just used to being, like, working all the time. And, you know, I don't know how much of that money you got spent. Or I ended up in my hands. They used to say, trust fund, you have a trust fund. I said, yeah, I trust mom and trust dad. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I lived good. You know, my parents spoiled me and I was a lucky guy. And, and I, I remember after my dad passed on, his business manager was like, uh, Josh, I got a check for you. I'm like, for what? He goes, well, this is your money. So I, I have a feeling there was no account. There was like some side accounting of the money I had earned. I think I probably earned a lot. And, you know, if my dad spoiled me, the way he spoiled me and my sister and the way we lived, it's all good. But, yeah. but the truth is, is to me, it was normal. It wasn't like, it wasn't like, oh, you know, I'm crushing this or it's going to make me turn into this or I'm going to become Leif Garrett. Like it was, yeah. it yeah. was nothing like that. So then what happened is like life takes over, right? You know, it's puberty and drugs and girls and driving and, you know, my, uh, maybe there wasn't as much work for a guy with a voice, a uh, 16 year old or a 17 year old or whatever. And I got into some darkness. And so, Ultimately, I didn't really get the, the the funny thing is is I got onto the auditioning circuit only because a boyfriend of my mother's, a guy she was going to marry, who was a big powerful entertainment lawyer. He had a son who graduated at USC, became a lawyer, and and was like kind of getting into the management game. And he said, like, "Josh, you know, you should let me send you out on stuff." And I was like. This is weird. Okay. Like to me, I was like, this is nothing to me. I've been doing this my whole life. Like I'm not, you know, right. I ain't in no class. I ain't this and that, the other. So his name was, the, his dad was Marvin Meyer. His name was Michael Meyer. And he, he, he found me an agent. This guy was getting, he goes, this guy's getting a lot of meetings for young actors. I met this guy. He was a great guy. His name was Mark Borenstein was his name. He was a great agent. And I started going on meetings. Like it was kind of my way of like 
hey, dad, I'm not being a total degenerate anymore. And my dad was super proud because he always wanted me to do it, but he never pushed me to do it. So um, I started going on, jo- on, on calls and I started getting like a lot of amazing feedback because I looked really young, but I was over 18. And that's what they want, right? Yeah, so they yeah, they, they can don't work. school you and all that. Yeah, so, right. First audition was this movie called Flying about this like gymnast and her weird offbeat buddy. We'll get back to that in a moment. There's a reason I said that. My next audition, one of them was Goonies. Oh, Goonies. And I, and I got a thousand callbacks yeah. and I'm meeting Spielberg and I'm meeting Dick Donner, the director, and they loved me. And I just, I didn't, I just didn't look young enough because I was, wasn't reading for the Josh Brolin part. I was reading for what later became the Corey Feldman part right. because they just couldn't hire me. And I remember getting a letter, a handwritten letter from them. Hey, Josh, obviously, you know how much we liked you. You know, they had me in. They were dyeing my hair. They were doing anything to make me look young enough to fit with the younger kids. And it just, it didn't happen. Right. They go, but, you know, we know we'll work together in the future. It's a pleasure meeting you. You're, you're going to have a fantastic career. Signed letter. And I was like, hey, you go on audition and you don't get it. And you get a letter. That was the last letter I ever <laughs> yeah, got. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now you get zero. You, you know, you get like, don't let the door hit you in the ass. Yeah. Down. We don't care. Yeah. So, you know, that was a... I, 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 my first TV job, my first real job was I got the show V. Oh, V, I, I remember yeah, V. Yeah, which everybody liked. The, the weird, alien one. Yeah, yeah. So, and it was the, ver- I remember it was the very first million dollar an episode show, supposedly. Anyway, I got this job and the guy who made V was the guy that made uh, Dukes of Hazard. His name was Skip Ward. He's a Look. big timer. Working in the Burbank studios right over here, you yeah. know. I was like, oh, I'm two months from being like on drugs and yeah. like being a total degenerate. And, and I just, I, I was like, this is easy. Like, this is not, like, I'm not, I'm not feeling like I'm, I have to be so excited that I got on this big TV show. To me, it was like, I've been doing this my whole life. Right, right. Like, I don't, everyone's like, talks about this stuff. Like, it's so important. I had gone to acting class to appease my father to get him on, you know, because he was like, Josh, what are you doing with your life? You know, and I, and in the acting class, these kids were like, what did you book? What did you book? My audition, my this one. And I still, I still wasn't even like, didn't even have an agent or a manager or anything. And I was like. I don't know about y'all, but I'm banging this Playboy centerfold that's in the class. Like that's, I was like a, a teenager. I, I just knew like girls and weed and I don't know. Yeah. So it's like ultimately everyone cared so much about this. And I've always had that problem with it all. It's so important to everybody what job they have in Hollywood. And I, I just was never that person. People would say, oh, well, it's because you grew up in it. Uh, okay. But like yeah. it wasn't made like a big thing in my house. So when I started working, I was like, I should get every job I go on. Yeah. You know, I, well, you got that ice in your blood too. I, I guess. Cause you don't really, if you don't really care, you go in and you go, oh, I booked it crazy. You know, it's funny that you say that Dean, the ice in the blood came out when I was on the set, I would crush, yeah. but ice in the blood for auditions. Uh, no tough, right? Auditions is just the most brutal thing. It's so gnarly. And it's funny. Bob Downey, we would always talk about it back then. Bob Downey was like, I loved auditions. I'm like, well, good for you. Yeah. But like I didn't they but sucked. get me on the set and I'm going to be your most valuable asset out there. And they've, all but told me that but boy to get there is like a creepy road you know and and so i don't know i mean i i was now i started to become a working actor then i got thrash in that movie then i got river's edge and there was some other heartbreak stories about what the ones you didn't get and i remember when i got river's edge you know there's this doctor they send you to this old funky guy he's probably been dead 30 years and you'd go over into the hollywood and vine this crusty old office and you'd meet this i think it was called dr michelson yeah. and he'd like put a stethoscope on your leg and be like you're fine but it was like this weird antiquated part of like checking you out and i remember going with keanu who got the role i was auditioning for in river's edge and of course because that was the story of my life christian slater got the role i was auditioning for in heathers i mean it's just you know yeah. whatever it's yeah. part of the game and so keanu and i get super stoned at my house and we're talking and i'm like so dude what, what you been doing and he, he goes oh I, you know i did this movie up in canada called flying yeah. Oh, oh. I, I, I was like, you mean the movie that cast me and went to Canada to cast the girl and said they'd be bringing me and then never called me again? And we joked about that. A movie that I don't think anyone ever saw. I don't even know. I mean, no one ever saw it. But, you know, I started to realize, okay, there's this little legion. I, and there was a pride in that, too. You know, all of a sudden, we're like, we're the working auditioners or the non-working right, auditioners. Right, right. It's like the open mic comedians. That, that exactly. You're going around in a pack. You're seeing each other at, at late night like, oh, I went in for fucking Krusty the Clown today. Yeah, same here. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And I think everybody knows who everybody is. You know, I would see the guys. I was always, you know, by the time I, you know, when I got 21 Jump Street was only just like a year or two later, um, which was a pretty seminal role for me because the character, they turned it into like a little bit of a recurring 
you know, and that was that was exciting because you know it, it, I had big show, big show. Yeah, and everyone did it. You know, Brad Pitt did yeah. it. Everyone in town, everyone in town was trying to do it, and a lot of people did do it. But like, you know, I was I, I didn't read really against the Keanu's and the Christian Slater's. I read against the Courtney Gaines, the Malachi from Children of the Corn, yeah. and I read against Max Perlick, little Max Perlick, you yeah. know, from uh, he was in Blow with it later and did a million things. Like, you know, we were all like the what I would call the ornamental degenerates, right? Like, yeah. you know, I don't read for no one named Steve. Yeah. Or no one named Matt, and I don't get the girl. <laughs> yeah. I'm the guy that like knows how to roll the joint and has the cool clothes. Yeah, and, and I always wore my own clothes because I would always say I'm the best ornamental degenerate in the business. And they're like, "Well, you got to leave the clothes with us. If you're doing your own wardrobe, you can't lose it." I'm like, "Trust me, I ain't losing it, and I'm not leaving it." Yeah, so yeah. They'd be like in a panic, and then, then then like you know, you wonder like this kid's difficult to work with. And I don't fucking know, but the the truth is, yet like you said, there's that that legion like open mic comics or the auditioning young male guys and you know so-and-so book this you hear about that you hear about this and you know i'm all of a sudden falling in with 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 now you know with keanu and downey and johnny and all my boys and these guys are all going to super stardom and i'm just like you know my agent's going to gotcha on this and critters five and i'm like Ugh. <laughs> my ego was just so big for no apparent reason and you know like i i i hated begging for jobs yeah and, and I didn't get enough joy when I would get the job because I'm like, I should get every one of these jobs. I've been doing this since I'm three years old. I'm good at this. But right. I also had like long hair down to my back. I didn't wear shoes. I was, you know, I was like a, I was like a, I was a kind of a crazy guy. So I, I get why maybe people were like, we want to hire that or we don't want that anywhere near ours. Yeah. Yeah. No that. shoes. What was the no shoes thing about? I love it. Because oh, you know what I love oh, about yeah. you is you're a lot like me where you have something that people can describe you. Oh, that fucking guy with the cane, man. Yeah. I know that, you know, like you, you, you're known as the guy with the cane yeah, and I no guess. shoes. What was that about? I was in high school. I hated my style. I, I didn't, you know, I kind of had a little bit more of a style to fit in. When I was in high school, it was the 80s. Yeah, so there same was man. like bad GQ, you know, like, like kind of like some of that style in the movie Valley Girl. Right. It was Miller's my, Outpost. My life was like the Nick Cage life, but my school and my style was like the other idiots. Right. The, the Tommy, the, the uh, 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 Michael Bowen guys with the collars up and like the top siders. Yeah. And colorful yeah. this and that, GQ. But I was like, that's not me. Like, it's just not me. Yeah. It's like the only time in my life I ever had short hair. Uh, it just wasn't me. So I think one of the very first things was like, I, I just didn't have any shoes I liked. And I remember I'd come to school, I took my shoes, I put them in my locker and I'd just kind of skate around school in my socks all day. And, and by the time I was out of school, it was just sort of, I was used to it. And then I think, I think when you're probably, you know, 18, 19 and people look at you and they're like, the dude with no shoes. And all of a sudden it's like, it's some badge of honor that like you go to any punk club you want or rock club you want or the movies or restaurants or you go anywhere and you don't wear shoes and you know you either get kicked out or you don't whatever but like it, it was like almost making yourself jump through hoops I know that I wasn't doing that actively I look back on it now a little bit more refined and I, I think well I was probably just saying you know it was my kind of it was it was my punk rock like it was like you know I don't I don't this is just how I do it right and, and then I would go on auditions and I would put shoes on so I felt in character and a lot of times I had to borrow shoes. I didn't really have any shoes. <laughs> or I would like if I like in River's Edge, those black Chuck Taylors with the red laces I wore in River's Edge. I still have those, and those are the only pair of Chuck Taylors I have. Wow. You know what I mean? So it's like I, I and Steve Caballero, who's doubling me in Thrashing. He's the skater that doubles Radley. Yeah. They loved that I didn't wear shoes. I did my audition for Thrash. I'm like, can you go out in the street and skateboard? I'm skating in socks. Yeah. And they're like, we love that. So my character doesn't wear shoes in the movie. Wear socks, and that's fine and dandy. Except when the guy who has to double you has to skate for real. Yeah. And so when you can always see he's got uh, socks pulled over his Chuck Taylor. Oh, that's hilarious. When he's doubling me, yeah. That's so, hilarious. So, I mean, that, that's all I can really tell you is it's probably about some reverse reg regimentation. Right. Like bucking the system. Although at the time it just seemed normal to me to not. I also... Yeah was super like thought I was a I thought I was like a Warner like a Daffy Duck you know I thought I was I thought I was a cartoon character and to me that's what cartoon characters look like yeah everything kind of like the foot the foot went into the leg went into you know I, they didn't break it up with a shoe except Marvin Martian right and then the first time I ever wore sneakers which was probably like 88 or 89 after having not worn them for seven years a friend of mine had given me a pair of big white sneakers. They were like two sizes too big. And I was like, this is kind of fun. Yeah. And I would wear them because it looked like Marvin Martian. And then I remember losing them because I would take them off and I'd go somewhere. And when I was leaving, I didn't remember, hey, I got to go get my shoes because I hadn't been wearing <laughs> shoes for seven years. Yeah. So that very, because people always say, when you started wearing shoes again, what shoes was it? 
And I remember those big white Reeboks with the red stripe from my friend Robert Chaikin, and then I lost them immediately, of course. That, that 80s time in Hollywood, I don't think people, uh, you know, and I want to make this very clear. I'm not talking about the strip. Okay, we know the strip was booming. We were, we were there, you know, you got the four million flyers on the poles and, and the thousands of people in the street. But I'm talking about shit like we were talking about earlier. Raji's, uh, even Coconut Teaser. Sure. The more Which, se- by the way, hide my club. Hi. Yeah. That's Coconut Teaser. Right, right. But the more seedy stuff and, and uh, you know, Hollywood Boulevard down there, man, back yeah, You weren't when getting your record deal out of Raji's and Coconut Tea. No, no. You but were trying to get up to the whiskey and the Roxy or right. whatever, the Troub, yeah. Right, right, right. So you're doing movies and you're going out at night, obviously. That's what we we're doing, we're going and seeing rock and roll. And at some point, this, I would say this thing starts to brew. And of course we had the early phase of like Quiet Riot and Motley Crue and stuff, but I'm talking about the stuff of guys that were like our age. And here comes the GNR, the Faster Pussycat, the LA Guns, the Jane's Addiction, all. I mean, you're talking about this was all like in my house. So right, yeah. right, right. So this starts to brew and and the town changes man it changes how do you get uh all running on this well it's funny when you say the town changes but you know when punk rock my sister was six years older so i got i got a real nice glimpse into that i was a little kid and they'd bring me to the shows but they'd make me sit on the stage like the thing if you were like a little kid at a show you had to sit on the stage it meant that like if your feet couldn't touch the ground, it means you couldn't drink. I don't know what that yeah, means. But, yeah. You know, so I had a six-year-older sister, my sister Heidi, who knew everyone and was part of it all. And so I, I, I don't, it's funny. Yes, we know the particulars of the teased hair and the cowboy boots and, and, and the flyer, the flyer. But guess what? I mean, before that, when it was punk rock, before the strip banished, basically all the clubs on the strip had to stop having music because of punk rock. Right. It only started back up again with Gazaris and those kind of bands. And then, you know, the, the quiet riots and the, and the, uh, 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 Motley Crue's and rat and stuff like that. Yeah. But, but for a long time, like that's a lot, a lot of punk rock or things that were deemed dangerous was banished off the strip. But because I grew up on the Sunset Strip, I didn't, I didn't drive to the Sunset Strip. I lived above the Sunset Strip. Yeah. I'm like that rare person that literally lived in the Hollywood Hills. I mean, my divorced dad was a bachelor dad who lived up Sunset Plaza. Wow. So like, you know, most kids, when, they, when they're getting out of the house and either you know, smoking their weed or taking their loot or whatever, eating their black beauties or whatever they're doing, they're like going to the 7-Eleven parking lot or the rec center parking lot. You know, I've said this a million times. Like, mine was Sunset Strip. Yep. When I got to the bottom, it was like make a left, and it was down towards like what, what became Roxbury, but like that was called Imperial Gardens and uh, 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 Sushi on Sunset, this crazy guy, Hana, who's dead now, but he used to be a fun guy to party yep, with. Yep. Like, go left over there or go right. Yeah. And it's Whiskey, Roxy, Rainbow. Yeah. And so, you know, you could be 14. And Ben know, Franks. Ben Franks. I lived in it. Loved it. Just Loved like, it. Now I'm, Mel's. Yeah. I just sat there in the lot all night. I, I was telling the story the other day. I, used, I, I, I must have eaten in Ben Franks a hundred times where Little Richard was, a, was, was two, two things away. Wow. Two booths away, you know. Wow. And that was another funny place. There was a late night manager that had hated me. And he knew I didn't wear shoes. So a lot of times we would have to sneak me in in a huddle because if this guy, remember his name was Jesse, he's a little punk, and if this guy was there and he saw me, he'd boot me out because he hated me because there was times he'd boot me out and I'd cuss him out and whatever, yeah. say inappropriate things. So, I mean, that, 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 was my, that was my spot. I mean, Ben Franks was the spot. It was and, the best. Know, that's where Crosby, Stills, and Nash kind of got formed. Stephen Stills and Neil Young like, ran across each other kind of in the Ben Franks parking lot. Wow. And that's known. It's in documentary yeah. books. but like I know, but it's so, it's it's, so well, icon- and when iconic. You, when you you know when you grow up there i mean to me it was normal i grew up there i didn't yeah. i didn't drive to the sunset strip yeah. i'm from Just the sunset walk strip it's yeah. weird i mean it i it is weird and i i think that you know maybe that ends up why i merit doing fun amazing things like this with you because there's not a lot of me's that yeah. grew up right there they may have had a band and lived there and their band is way more important than i'll ever be fine but you ain't from there yeah i'm actually from there i'm part of the weeds that grow on the sidewalk there, it's funny you know? say that when i was uh, interviewing Duff, i showed him a picture of he and i back in 87 Duff mckagan yeah from seattle and he goes he he was quiet for a minute and he goes yeah you were there you were fucking there. You know what I mean? Like, well, the lot- picture you just yeah, showed me—you right, right. look exactly like 
all the sort of kids that were in and around. Right. You know, like, you know, when, when he had nary a pot to piss in, Tammy was my sister's boyfriend. Yeah. Up in the house, broke ass, looked amazing, had the best style. His band was great. Then all of a sudden, she, you know, she was friends with the, with the current girlfriends of the Guns N' Roses. Like, it, you know, Pat Mata from Community FK, his wife, Stephanie, was my sister's best friend. So I was in, you know, since I was a young kid, I was up in the whole, like, post-punk goth crowd with Community FK. And they were fantastic. You know, Pat's a damn genius. And, and I learned, I, I was just up in it. It was like my recreation. Yeah. There was a time when Community FK rehearsed in my dad's, like, commercial studio. I got them free rehearsal. And my dad was so cool to everybody. And, you know, Pat and I talked about it recently. Like, what a cool thing. You're this band trying to get by. You have a free rehearsal space in Hollywood that nobody has. It's lockout. Great. Great. You know what I mean? So like there's so much by, by being in it and of it that just happened because this this was my boardwalk. Like the Sunset Strip was my cross street. You yeah. Know? It wasn't like walk up here, walk. No, no. That was my cross street. I right. Lived, that's where I'm from. So I don't know. It's just interesting because I don't, there is a badge of honor to it, but I also, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that comes with it too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I like to look at it as like, and what I love about you is you remind me a lot of myself where we're, I call a lot of people hair metal tumbleweeds because they're just blowing around sunset right now. Like, what happened? <laughs> but that's just one chapter in our lives. And, and you're like me, constantly looking for new music, constantly looking for the new thing and, and being out and living and not sitting home on the couch and living a full life in Los Angeles, going for it, you know? It's funny because, you know, kind of picking up where the chronology was leaving off where we were talking about it, I got this movie, Class of 1984, I think, um, and, I, and I, I was up in Seattle, and I was like playing sixth banana to a bunch of nobodies, and I was like, you know, if I'm not, I should be the lead in this movie. I'm not, but I wanted the job. But then I got up there, and I was like, ah... Uh, I'll leave out some of the other particulars out of it because I've said them before on different things, but I just was like, my life in LA is so much better than my career. Yeah. Like, I'm playing Sixth Banana, a bunch of bozos. Anyway, I pulled a little scam. I got out of the movie and uh, uh, came home because, like, you know, I wanted to go to Jane's Addiction. I screamed that night. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I wanted to go where my friends were. And what, I, I knew what was happening. And the truth is, my career wasn't that happening. Yeah. I was happening. Easy to give it up. <laughs> You know, by the way, you don't have to give it up. No. If you were filming a pilot tomorrow and you said, Josh, be in it, I would be in it. Mm -hmm. When Fred makes a movie, he puts me in every movie he does. I don't yeah. have to give it up. I just don't have to act like it's my need or necessity. And now maybe with my, you know, with my next, as we get to the chronology, with my whole next 20 years of success in the nightlife business, maybe with that ending with Corona, maybe I will have to go back to being a working <laughs> actor. And I've always thought that at the end of the day, if that's what I had to do to feed my family, that's no problem. No problem. I'll go back and do it. Yeah. It's funny how your friends want to help you a lot more when they think you need it. Yeah. When they don't think you need it, no one's really trying to help you that much. <laughs> but boy, when they think you need it, your friends will help you. They and, will. You know, I got the right friends for that. This so, town, man, people think it's all fake and everything, but I've had some of the most realist friends uh, on the planet in this town. Uh, and they'll call me, they call me all through Corona. Hey, dude, you okay? You need anything? You need some money? You need some food? Whatever. They're just fucking there. Yeah, you rela know? relationship you know, foundational relationship, both creation and elaboration is what it's all about. Yeah. How it pertains to work or money or jobs is, is, is another step. But yeah, we, you know, we build our, we build our, our, our family and it's, it, it, people, you know, can say, oh, you know, you have your blood family or this. Well, yeah, but you know, your friends, your lifelong friends, that's your chosen family. Yeah. And, and it's, to me, especially having lost my parents at a young age, you know, my mom died when I was 14, my dad when I was 21. Damn. So, so my my family really is my chosen family really and is. the people i've been with you know some people that i've mentioned here today and, and others people that all along the way like we pick each other up like vagabonds on the street you know there's guys i know that were like struggling artists just squirrely fun cool charismatic dudes getting by you know that's norman Reedus. he became the biggest star on television i knew him we didn't have a pot to piss in yeah you know what i mean like i i i, I 
I know what it's like to see. I know when someone carries themselves with as though that like they're the same person whether they're on a TV show or not or on a, a in a big band or not. Because a lot of those big bands ain't big bands anymore. No. But you know what? Tammy Down is still a fantastic musician. Fucking great. He still supports himself. He's all good. Yeah, faster pussy guy. Are they make you know? There's no such thing as a gold record really anymore. But like you know, yeah, that, that that's a time gone by. But guess what? Tammy still makes great music. He still tours all the time. He's healthier than he's ever been. He looks fantastic and he's doing great. Yeah. So it's not all bad. Bad casualties. You no, know? no. Uh, it's not. And you know what? A matter of fact, it's funny you say that. Uh, I'd be in New York for like eight months a year and then come back and I'd see somebody like you. And then I'm like, oh, I'm look, back. I love this town. Yeah, I'm you back. Know? Yeah, yeah. I really, you know, and not at a club. I'm talking about like a Fred Siegel eating sure. lunch or whatever. And I'm like, oh, fuck yeah. I, I've always actually prided myself on being that sort of ambassador, denizen. Yeah, you know, I resonate that. Even though for all my life, a lot of people think I'm from New York and I spent an enormous amount of time in New York. The first movie I ever produced was this documentary we made in 92. We took Downey on the campaign trail and made this amazing movie called The Last Party. I lived in New York that whole year practically. I mean, I, 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 have, I have Richie and Noah, both Noahs. I have diehard friends. And my only other real blood family besides my sister is in, is in New York. So, you know, I love that city, but, but I, I, and I've been all over. I've spent tons of time in Chicago and San Francisco, but the truth is, 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 LA is the best, man. I don't yeah. care what anybody says. Yeah. Why do you think they're building all these $20 million houses? Yeah. Because everyone that has become rich somewhere else realizes they can run their plastics company in Belgium from their iPad and they buy a house in the Hollywood Hills yeah. or Bel Air, Brentwood or Beverly Hills. Yeah, yeah. They're buying it in Cleveland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, so this is a beautiful place with it's a it's an opulent and beautiful place with fantastic art, you know. Uh, uh, geography and climate, and I don't, I don't, I, I get why people talk shit, but those are just people that either yeah. had a bad ride here, don't yeah. get it, or mad at it. Like I'm not mad at it. <laughs> well, a lot of people, uh, and I'm not mad. At, uh, I'm not mad at the people either. I understand what it is. It's more of uh, they're angry at theirself because they didn't go for it. They didn't fucking. Move. Or it was hard on them. It which was is, hard. By the yeah. way, I think we could both sit here, both of us, pretty damn successful. It's been pretty hard on everybody. Fuck yeah. Bob Downey will tell you how hard it's been on him. Yeah. You know, like it's been hard on. Everybody, Fucking it's hard. It's brutal man. here. Try and get on top and sit on top for 20, 30 years. No way. Which, yeah. which, funny yeah. chronologically, one, once I, once I kind of came back from that movie that I told you about, it, Axel and I were super close. He, he really. We, How do you guys meet? Well, I think there's that whole scene, right? Like right. I, I had become pretty close to Slash and my, you know, my sister was close to all the girlfriends. And, you know, it was like you said, you know, it was a pocket. Totally. Everyone kind of knew everyone. Like it was an insular little pocket. And, you know, Ricky and Tammy are like my fam. And so it's like, cat you know, house. I, I, I live at the cat house. I live at all Bordello, all those clubs. But like, I, I think what happened with me and Axel is he, he, he grew up or his, you know, sweet child of mine is a girl called Erin Everly. Yep. I grew up with her. Yeah. So at some point, I, I mean, Axel told me the story. Uh, Todd Crew from Jet Boy had yep. died. He had gone to New York with me on a trip. Um, he was down and out here in LA. I said, hey, come with me to New York. We'll have a good time. I was the first singer in Jet Boy. Come on. <clears throat> yep. I had no idea. That's fantastic. <laughs> Does that mean Billy and all those guys are all your old boys? Oh, God, yeah. Billy lives up the street from That's me now. So we hang out Bernie like... Bernie Rod. Fuck yeah, okay. dude. So, so I take Todd with me to New York. Yep. It's a new music seminar. Um, ultimately, I think Slash is coming out later. I, I'm there for... I don't even see Todd that much. I'm there for a bit. I fly home. Todd goes and hangs with Slash. And, you know, he ends up, he ends up ODing in a bathtub. Right. And, and uh, which was sad. He was a bright, smart, funny guy. And, you know, there's casualties of, of excess. Yeah. We all know that, you know. Well, when I first met him, dude, I never met anybody like this. Todd? I come in. I'm in high school. And I guess he's in high school, too, but he looks like he's about 25. He's got a giant tiger tattooed Tattooed, on him, which no one at the time, other than Bon Scott, had a giant tattoo. And I was like, whoa. He's also from a good family in Piedmont. Yeah, totally. And we're on the way to rehearsal, and he stops and gets a bottle of uh, like whiskey or Southern Comfort or something at like midday. And and Todd I'm, was the real machine. Yeah, and I'm like, man, this motherfucker's outlaw. Yeah, you he, know? Was, no, he was. Yeah. You know, he, he had been thrown out of the band. He had then gone and roadied for GNR on their way up just because they wanted to give him a job and party and hang. Yeah. And so, so, you know, Todd slipped away and, and then there was a funeral up there in Piedmont. And Axel told me, he's like, he, you know, he was pissed off because his friend was dead and he was like looking around thinking like, these aren't his friends. Who are these people? And then he looked over at me in my, in my no shoes, you yeah. know, or whatever. And he's, and he's like, 
and who is that guy? You know, and, and he would tell me that later. And then I think Aaron, Aaron had told him. And then he would see me around his world. You know, they played these four really seminal shows at the Perkins Palace where every great band in LA Crusher. opened up for them. And, and I remember being on the side of the stage and like he kind of he came up to me and was talking to me. And, you know, what I, one thing I've known about Axel, and I don't know who knows him anymore or what, but I think that he was really, he was, first of all, he's a very bright guy. Very bright, very... Very aware guy and and uh, and a loyal friend, but he also he he liked this lifestyle out here. You know, Izzy had been out here for quite some time. Axel came out here, kind of following Izzy, right. looking for Izzy. Like Izzy, Izzy blazed the trail from West Lafayette, Indiana, and and I think uh, I think that he saw me as somebody who was like, you know, this guy has his own thing going on. He has his own flavor. He's you know he knows my band. He knows Slash. Like, he's in and around this scene. He's in all these clubs. He knows he's got like. like he don't need me. He's not going to, like... Right. And I, I think he liked that... He like, doesn't need anything from me. You know, He's got his own thing. I think he liked it, like... You know, and then, and then very quickly, he met a lot of my friends, which is this whole other world of all these actor kids and all these people. And I just think there was a, there was a real nice camaraderie for us, and that was around the time, right? When he's like, you know... We were, we were, we were kind of. Con he was talking about the conceiving of how he wanted it. He wanted to make Michael Jackson and, Gun and, and uh, Madonna style videos he won't you know they were the biggest band in the world and they hadn't they hadn't toured arenas yet headlining they hadn't headlined yet really and they were the biggest band out right so they had they had stop gapped with the lie with the um the record uh lies which yeah. had patience on it yeah and even that video like was thrown together and it, you know it was kind of thrown together their their old manager at the time was kind of the one responsible and he said no i want to make big time videos this is what i want to do we started talking about the story we started you know writing it and storyboarding it we asked sean penn to direct the don't cry video and he said yes but you know we we we, we took a while to finish and yeah. sean went and made indian runner yeah. Which is fantastic. Oh yeah, yeah. And so and so I I liked the pace and the tone of the father figure video and I said, Axel, I won't let's hire this guy, Andy Morahan. We hired Andy Morahan. Um, you know, the storyboards I made are, are identical to the video, every frame. And so, you know, it was interesting to be, you know, in my mid twenties and all of a sudden I'm basically in charge of all Guns N' Roses video world and uh, And we're talking the illusion records. Let's, yeah. let's let's tell them which videos these are. So I, I wrote and produced the Don't Cry I wrote the, the Don't Cry record the Don't Cry video with Axel. It says you know, he's written the credit in the front. It says written yeah. by Axel Rose and Josh Richmond. And then I you know, I produced it, I hired everyone and was and essentially like it must have sucked for them because, like, you had the answer to me, and I was pretty wild and out there. Plus, I'm like also dealing with him, and you know, he's he's difficult in that, like, you know, if he didn't like the way the picture was hung on the wall, it would have to be moved. He was such a, a stickler for detail, which is I kind of appreciate it. But you know, it would everybody walked on eggshells, and uh, but we, you know, whether you think whether Beavis and Butthead made fun of it or you think of it as indulgent or not, it was the video we wanted to make, and it was essentially meant to be like a trailer for this trilogy, and then the the ultimate movie that he wanted to make. Oh wow! And you know. People were sniffing around. I mean, Scorsese was sniffing around. Jay Maloney, who's also now dead, was a big, the big young star agent at, at, at uh, CAA. He represented Scorsese, and they were sniffing around. There was all this sniffing around because there was just nothing more huge at the time than, than that band. And Shannon Hoon's in this one? Shannon Hoon is in that one. Yeah, he, he sang on it. He yeah. was a kid that knew, I think, his sister kind of grew up with Axel. Axel knew he was a good singer. He came out here. And, and by singing on that song, Shannon Hoon got a record deal yeah. and then blew, blew up and then also expired too. Yeah. Long. I mean, it's crazy. These kids from West Lafayette, Indiana, you know, someone plants a seed somewhere and it sprouts. You never know what follows. So that was an interesting sideline because I'm no longer on the audition circuit I, I didn't see myself as someone that was gonna like go make rock videos, even though I, I knew a lot. You know, big, when I, the room we were cutting in and post productioning in, Michael Bay was in, David Fincher were in, they were making rock videos at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, Fincher did the fucking, he did like uh, great ones like the Wallflower, Sixth Avenue, Heartache with all the Polaroids. And, oh, yeah, no, no, they yeah. were, they were the, that's how they became featured directors because totally. they were making the best videos. And so Chris Cunningham, I think at the time, was he, was he happening yet? Anyway, the point is, is like, I didn't see, once again, it kind of goes back to the, the kind of like the tenor of what we're talking about. I really just was me. I didn't, I wasn't me the big time video producer. I was the big time video creator producer because the guy I was doing it with my partner, we were friends and that it, it evolved organically. Now, did you do the trilogy or just the well, one? So, so then, then uh, 
we knew, we knew that November Rain would be the wedding and the funeral. Prior to production on November Rain, there was, once again, it's, 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 I never really talked about it. There's no need to really get into the marrow of it. There was just a very non-linear, how about that, to use a term that Axel used to like to use, uh -huh. a very non-linear, ethereal falling out that encompassed things about past lives and such. Well, between you and him. Yeah. And, you know, it was a hard thing. What does that even mean now? Well, <laughs> you know, when, when your very dear friend and the guy you're working with and there's so much wrapped up in it. By the way, it's not easy. It's not no. that easy working with the biggest rock star in the world because everyone around you has got a problem with something. Yeah. Every, no one's happy about it. Everyone, and everyone, everyone, wants everyone wants to replace you. Everyone's mad. Just so some, you know, you, you realize, wow, like, by the way, when you, and I, I, once again, I've told this story, you know, in the few times I've sat down in a situation as uh, lofty as yours, but like, when he first asked me, I was like, no, 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 yeah, absolutely not, dude. Yeah. I love you. You're a great friend. I'm feeling if we do that, it's going to be problems. Uh, uh, uh. He's yeah. like, no, 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 I'll worry about that. I go, no, dude, no, dude, no. And it, you know, with him, th those days, right, and I think it's probably still that way with him, you stay up all night. So like he was in the Shoreham Towers right below my house. And yeah. Like, driving home at the daybreak, going, getting in my bed at like five, six in the morning that morning. And of course, when I go to bed, there's a Guns N' Roses video on MTV. I've slept with the TV on my whole life. I looked at it, I go, God, you know, if I don't say yes, then these videos or, or the Don't Cry video is going to be a video that I'm going to say, he asked me to do that. Yeah. So like, ah, you know, fuck it, let's do it. Yeah. So prior to that, then, then the Terminator thing came up. And so I was, I was in charge of, of the production side for Guns N' Roses. For You Could Be Mine? Mm-hmm. Wow. Which was, you know, we did three, he, there was three really fun shows. Uh, Warfield and Frisco. Killer, I went. Pantages in LA. I got the ticket right over there. Dope. Yeah. That's awesome. Unbelievable. Yeah. Pantages in LA. Yep. And Ritz in New York. Yep. So we filmed all those and that was going to be the performance part of the video, which as you saw, it was. Yeah. Um, and you know, even some of the shots in it are my hand cam. They, the editors would say, oh, we got it. We, we have a tough body. Well, let's go to the Josh cam. Yeah. So we made that first. That was huge and fun. Got our feet wet a little bit. Great video. I, great song. Great song. Great video. Yeah. Oh my God. What a punch in the face, huh? And, and yeah. Their first, their first song from the record. Actually, the first oh, new music. Civil anyone, War. That was the first yeah. one anyone heard. But Loved this it. was big. You know, it's also like five and a half minutes long, but they're so big at the time, they could just swing their dick around and do whatever. Civil was. War was crazy, so, though, because you got Appetite, and I fucking, I worship Appetite. I remember I was going to the airport uh, in San Francisco, and, and they... We're driving there, and they go, here's some brand new Guns N' Roses. I go, oh, what the fuck? Are you for real? Because, you know, there's no, no internet or anything. Turn it on, you know, the whistle, and what we've got here is, is a failure, failure to, to communicate. communicate. And you're like, what the fuck is this? And it's like, look at the younger time. Yeah, ridiculous. Like, yeah, but you then, couldn't believe that this band that had just uh, taken the world over yeah. is now putting out new music that's as good as the old music. It, it never happens. I couldn't even. Except if you're the devil. To me, it was like another devil. level, actually. You're like, wow. Or Alice how, how would they write this fucking song, you know? Yeah. It's just yeah, so, no, I, I, it's yeah. like a saga. Well, and it's on the, the way, radio. If you really remember, which I don't doubt that you do, the first yeah. time we really heard it. Yeah. Oh yeah, Farm Aid. Farm Aid. Absolutely. So, so <laughs> that's that's when Adler that's gets when you fired. First heard yeah. it, right? And then he cusses, and Dick Clark goes, "Oh, which yeah, is yeah, I still have oh, a yeah. recording of it." Yeah, so, yeah. You know, th this was a this is a crazy thing to be riding around doing. I'm still me. I'm still the dude who's like grew up in the Hollywood Hills and my lifestyle, my friends, the nightclubs. You know, we we haven't even touched on that because that's really the next really intense. Of course, I can't wait. For me, right? And and like all of a sudden, you're this guy. And, and, and now you're all of a sudden you're making all the videos for the biggest band in the world. Some of the people that knew me forever didn't even necessarily know I was friends with him, right? Yeah. So that, it was a lot. And, P, and then I think I'm sure, I was young, so I'm sure I had an attitude. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I definitely heard about it later. Yeah. But like, it's a crazy, it's, it, I'm sitting here ancient yeah. with a three and a half year old son at home and a family. Like, I'm just telling you, like, sometimes... Dude, it was so high-octane back then. I was trying I, it, to tell it's, Bill it's Burr... Pretty, it is pretty mind-blowing. I was trying to tell Burr, I go... I love him. Yeah, he's, he's like one of my best friends. And I'm not saying that to drop fucking names, whatever. Fuck, oh, yeah, fuck it, yeah. But you're allowed to have friends that are famous. I mean, right. Famous right. people can have friends too, you know. Yeah, yeah. And he wasn't famous when I fucking he's, met him. You know what I mean? Fucking great. Yeah. I saw but him in that Pete I try, movie the other night. I try to explain to him the boiling and the 
the insanity and the high octane of that era. And I'm not talking fucking hair band and a million videos. I'm talking about straight Hollywood out at night. Oh, yeah. At a GNR show or, or a fucking Jane's Addiction show. And you're going like, the planet, it was like it was on nitrous, man. I, I get it, dude. I, I mean, it's funny, too, because you're right. Like, people who weren't there, everybody wants to know. Yeah, and like, you can't describe I it. I told you that story about Tall telling Kells who I was. Yeah. Everybody wants to know. Yeah. Because no one's ever been a part of that. Yeah. And if you're from here, you grew up in it. You know, I watched punk rock happen in front of me through my sister's eyes and my ability to, like, go when I was a kid. Yeah. And I watched the dark the goth movement and, and and kfk and then you know pat's drummer matt chaikin who was in the d detroit band uh prior to that per when pat left to england to do another project perry started jane's addiction with matt chaikin my like like a brother of mine so i was at the second rehearsal yeah. you know what i mean like i was i helped them book one of the, it's it's in the spin magazine i helped them book one of their very first shows ever like yeah. like i was there with jane's addiction from the very beginning you know I was standing with Perry Farrell on the street the day they got their star on Hollywood Boulevard and I remember we were looking around and you know there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of relics from way back when you yeah. know but it's like the truth is is I was there before that I was there during it and I'm still there now and <laughs> and and it, but I get guess, guess what the same way you get excited about it yeah. dude I still get excited about it yeah. I'm proud of it yeah. I'm proud to have seen it all through that bit, bit walked it smelled it all the all my long black cashmere coats I would wear. Yeah. The pockets were filled. Those pockets are all. I have all the stuff. I've kept everything. Yeah. To, to the dismay of <laughs> Christina and and you know the people who've lived with me in my home. Like anyone who's been through any of my homes, they're hedge mazes of just all my stuff. Yeah. And uh, but you gotta love me for it because you know you lose your family, then you want to keep all your artifacts. I oh, I like got I, it all. I, 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 like I, I, I I'm looking around. I you got a, that. That stuff's just the the for sale leftover. But when I do buy a place, it'll be a goddamn museum because I'm like you. I kept it all. I've got it all. And and, and I think the ephemeral parts of your life. Yeah. Um. You know, there's art I collected that the artists became really big artists I'm yeah like, cool. i'm glad about that yeah. but like you know yeah my son who love my son is three and a half and has better taste in music than almost anyone you and i both know uh he's gonna know and i'm gonna tell him the downsides of it too way more than i was told yeah but like i don't want to i don't want to homogenize the life that i've led because i think that along the way you constantly refine and you constantly grow and you constantly are are helped to do so by all of your loved ones ascensions together you know i mean I, I used to go visit robert downey in the penitentiary yeah the legitimate penitentiary yeah not like over there i'm talking about corcoran state penitentiary yeah you know still my brother i would buy him a burger out of the wall which was better than the food he was getting in the prison yeah you know it, it, it i could i could cite a million of those instances where as we all can, of everybody that we come up with, all the stuff that's happened to us, every breakup, every death, every trauma, you know, and that's all the other stuff, although, like you said, that white hot nitro of what it felt like to go scream to Jane's Addiction that night, Guns N' Roses at the Roxy that night, Faster Pussycat over here, L7 over here, yeah. you know, all, all the stuff that was happening. I, I didn't see Rage when they were playing at Raji's, but yeah, I mean, I didn't like, either, Rage yeah. was happening then. Right. Like, you know, we, we were living within all this stuff that the, getting back to my point about everyone looks here for the, the export of what we make out here and what gets made out here. Right. Well, guess what? I haven't heard a band as good as Rage Against the Machine in about as that long. So either have I. You know, so like we made that all out here. Yeah. L seven. I mean, dude, uh, uh, Danita's from Chicago. Yeah. You know, it's cool that everybody comes out here, and then this is where they got to go. That's where the record labels are. I get it, but you know, they they stay out here. Most of them stay out here. It's a beautiful place, and I will say that that the, the come down from the Guns N' Roses thing was weird because all of a sudden something I never asked for even an anticipated. I was telling the story earlier today. I remember running into Chris Cornell, who I love and miss, you know, uh, at Daily Grill on La Cienega. And he's like, dude, the video is amazing. And would you ever think about, you know, I'd love to talk to you about it. And I was like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm also the guy that just made that video. So, like, you know, I get it. I, 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 I never have really been able to go, yeah, this is really dope. You know, you heard me say it earlier about River's Edge or even Thrashing or Jump Street, the stuff yeah. that I've done. But, but like... At the time, you don't. I don't think of it that way. Maybe that's a good thing. But so now here I am. It's 1992. Axel has gone off into the ether and Axel world, and uh, 
I have no idea. I have really no idea what is going to happen to me. Right. I, 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 I quasi quit a movie in Seattle. Um, I could say it's fun to go see the band and do, my life is great, but my life's not going to pay me. Yeah. So now it's, and now Johnny starts the Viper Room in 93. Yep. Um, I, I had gotten lucky enough. I needed a hernia surgery, so I wanted to get my SAG insurance. So Downey sent a bunch of his friends to meet Oliver Stone for Natural Born Killers, just for like little ancillary parts, and I'm the one that got it. Wow. So I, I'm, all summer, I'm in Chicago on Natural Born Killers. Whoa. And, and, but like, I'm not really doing anything. I know, movie, but, but still. But I mean, I'm, listen, I have a role. You see me in the movie, but like. Another masterpiece, though. Pretty, pretty intense. That, we, could, we could do a half hour on Natural Born Killers alone, by the way. Dude, fucking. It was. Just fucking uh i mean rodney alone as the fucked up dad didn't oh you feel yeah when uh, they do the fake tv show yeah that uh, was no that movie is and by the way changed the landscape of filmmaking styles that were done in that movie from bob richardson who's the famous lighting guy to oliver and the cutting that's been ripped that's been ripped off a billion times yeah um and it was intense it's sizemore it's juliet it's woody it's tommy lee you know he was fantastic um tommy lee jones you know bob is on fire oh. bob is on fire Fire smoker dude and what so a like and, you know we're having film. a party every night it's crazy and oliver's like it's a party every it, that thing was wild anyway i get i i you know i come home from that i, I have that surgery yeah and you know i'm looking up it's 1993 and i'm like and the next thing you know uh my dear dear friend you you had to remember rick calamaro absolutely so my dear old friend rick who grew up at the playboy mansion grew up in the hills with me you know we were running dogs through, through all this everything we've talked about and more you know he's like uh i want to do a party at, at he had been doing a uh he he had been one of the first people allowed to do on the rocks oh on the rocks yeah, loved it. it was a yeah. private little thing yeah. it was private it was lou above adler's, the roxy lou adler's private club above the roxy you had to have a key nicholson had a key magic johnson had a key but like no one ever hung out there at one point he wanted decided he wanted to make money or have well, i don't know so his half daughter uh victoria sellers and her friend heidi fleiss oh they get one night and somehow or another rick got the other night wow and so rick had been like he had never done this and Rick had also never been that legit. So he was like making money and throwing parties and like it hit a vein. That's his life. That's him. And he's like, I want to do one at, at peanuts. And that's the place where Bordello was. Right. And, and he go, he goes, we can do a strip show there. So we, he, he has the idea and I like great idea in my mind. I'm like, uh, you know, I've already been an actor. I've already dabbled in the drug world. Uh, I don't know if I want to be a nightclub promoter. I'm like, yeah. really? Am I going to do this shithole trifecta? <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. The, tri <laughs> the trifecta. Am I going to be an actor? This, like, okay. I, I said, Let, let's see how it goes. Yeah. So I help him. And opening night, uh, a, a, another friend of ours was like the MC role, and he was kind of stiff. So by the, by the, and Rick was like, man, you know, it's so great. You, you got to do this. You got to do this. So the, next, the second night, and I admit that, you know, honestly, the second night, I took the mic. Yeah. And I invited with Rick. And we just threw the sickest party ever. Maybe the sickest party ever in Los Angeles. Ever, ever, ever. Power tools. People say that's the greatest. May have very well have been. When I did Ledoux, I would say this last run at Ledoux. Hyde. This last run at Hyde. The new Hyde, Hyde Sunset. Last six years. That's been pretty unparalleled. But I got to say, Granville, for what it meant at the time it meant and how wild... Pretty, pretty legendary. You know, we were on CNN, every news show, every news magazine. Basically, it was a hip hop dance club. Ben Baller, who's now gone stratospheric, was our DJ. Um, you know, he, we just, we did a strip show at midnight. Yeah. Like we, we stopped. What club where do you stop the music at 12 o'clock? Yeah. And there's not a riot. We stopped the music. Everyone gathered around. They made change and strippers would come out because this place had a license for that. Right, right. And so now, and then it's funny, there was that movie Exotica, which the, which, uh, uh, the, the brothers that became chicks. Yeah, yeah, um, oh yeah, 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 yeah. The Wachowski brothers. Yep. Before they made Matrix, they needed to show Joel Silver they could make a movie and they made that movie with that girl that was about a stripper. Right. Demi Moore did the movie yeah. about a stripper. Right. So all of a sudden, stripping is like the trendiest thing in the world. So not only do we have the strippers, and every girl in town is getting up and taking their clothes off on stage. It was wild. I mean, it was yeah. just a wild scene. Yeah. So now all of a sudden I'm like, oh, you can make this much money doing nothing? Now how do you, how were you making money? Is back it just, then, there was no bottle service. Right. You took money at the door. Right. And the, and the club took the drinks. Wow. So we didn't care who bought a drink. I yeah. had a bag of drink tickets, gave yeah. them to everybody. Yeah. You know, 
qualified. And you charged to get in? You charged to get in. Back then, I guess there was a lot less um, entitlement than I remember because we made money at it. And and uh, I couldn't believe that like this, like it was kind of hitting a home run for me, really. Right. Like, I just have to like throw. Everyone always thought I did nightclubs anyway. You know, I had been so close to Matt Dyke and John Seidel and Solomon and all the guys that were doing all the great clubs in LA, Power Tools and Lunch and all the great clubs in the mid to late 80s. And, and, and even Cat House and stuff, you know, Ricky and Tammy, like everyone just thought I did them, but I, but I didn't. Yeah. So this one I did. Yeah. And this shit was a fucking interstellar. As good as going to see Jane's Addiction, but except that we did it once a week. And they were buzzing. For Those five and a half years. Club was buzzing, man. Was it's just fucking fu- and buzzing. And everybody came. Yeah. I've got video of James Gandolfini and, 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 and uh, Chris Penn, who are both deceased now, and no one even knew who they were. I've got video of Bono. I've got video of Nick Cage. I've got video of Leo. He's probably 15 or 16, 17 at the most. Yeah, Ed Gilbert Camp, Grape Diaz, era. You name it. And a lot of those videos are actually up on Facebook somewhere, because that was the beginning of the paparazzi video culture and those guys camped out in front of my club right and so rick and i had a great run and all of a sudden i'm like and by the way even when that ended let me i'm not gonna lie to you even when that ended five and a half years later i still didn't know what the hell i was gonna do when i grew up yeah like i had made some money which was nice and and like i didn't feel scared but but that ended why did it end it just ran its well, course I mean, like a nightclub yeah, like, right like five and, a, and th- by the way at yeah. that time there had never ever ever been a club like that yeah people would have runs they would move around this thing was in the same night the same building for five and a half years and that had never been done wow so i you know you know what happened i'll tell you what happened other people started getting into it a guy who later became my current partner of over 20 years hartwell it's another kid from oh, hollywood oh yeah hartwell he grew up with davy arquette and all those boys and hartwell and, and steven dorf and that whole crowd and hart started doing a little party and he picked my night to do it. Oh. So we're like dragging around a dead corpse and Hart's doing like a hot new party. And, you know, it, 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 it signaled the time. And, yeah. and, and, uh, and, and other people, you know, it happens. You can't, yeah. you can't own a night forever. So now we're looking at, now we're looking at the year 2000 and, and I'm literally looking up and I'm like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. And interestingly enough, Sal, who ran the Viper for Johnny, was like, you got to come see this party that I, that I started last week. It's a lesbian night. But you know those fake disco bands? The yeah, yeah. Booty Quake, Boogie, Boogie Nights, Nights and all them. Goes, Groove those, line. Those guys have a, a, a hair metal version. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, okay. He goes, dude, it's so good. And they, right. were, they were called Metal Shop. Camaro, dude. Camaro, dude. I w- I, no one knows that that's what it was called. Oh, dude. So I slept what, are you kidding me? So, 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 and I want to talk about Camaro once we get this wrong because I really want to talk about Look, I just got goosebumps. Oh, it's, look, that's real. I want to it talk about that. By the it way, is real. ladies and gentlemen, it is, Dean Del Rey it is real. firing goosebumps. Because I, want, I might as well tell the story now, and then we'll talk about how Camaro. Camaro, what people don't understand, was basically this great night that this hair metal well, wait, band. I, I, yeah. Let me, let me okay. say how it got to yeah, where you saw Yeah, let's get it. Because yeah. you definitely didn't see it when I'm talking about, right? Yeah. So he, the, uh, these lesbian promoters crush it the first night. Sal dresses the place up like a poison video. There's chicken wire in front of the fence, like how Ministry did. There's, you know, there's neon stickers everywhere. It looks like a poison video. Second night, which in the club business is known to be very difficult. Anyone can do a first night. Yeah. Uh, he calls, he's like, dude, the lesbians had four people. Oh. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I've got this thing, you know, with the band. I got to pay him, you know, so please help me. So I had gotten him this one kid, this kid at the time who was doing Ricky Vodka's Club with No Name. Yeah, Amy. Club Vodka. I had gotten him this kid called Apollo who was into like cool music. I don't remember what happened to that kid. I'd gotten him that D- as a DJ, but then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to get Tammy. Yep. So I call Tammy. He's like, I'm down. So Tammy comes in as my DJ. I come in, I take the mic. Yeah. I, I hate admitting this. So of course, it's the lowest common denominator. Sal was like, to fire this up, we got to do a, a, a wet t shirt contest. Right. I'm like, oh my God. They're like, yeah, nice Jewish boy who just did a strip club for five years. I'm like, oh. But this God. is different okay. though. This is white trash. <laughs> so, <laughs> so t- to kick it off, and by the way, Rock was not back. Not at this all. This is 2000. No, no. And okay. I, that's this why, is that's, soul patches and wallet chains and yeah. nobody gives a shit. That's why I want to tell this okay, story, so man. I come in. We, I start helping book the bands, a lot yeah. of great bands. We do a wet t-shirt contest for a very short time. Yeah. People that say they remember that, they, it wasn't that long because yeah. after a minute, we didn't need it. And the place goes fire. They go from, they go from metal shop to metal school to yeah, then, Jamie Susan to then who everybody knows as Steel Panther right so I started that party and that went 
for 11 years with me and even after me. But so now, now you can tell what you got to tell everybody what it really was. Here's what's going on. And I just told this story on, uh, I just did a thing at the Troubadour. 2000-ish, 2001, two, whatever it is, Camaro's booming, Tammy's DJing. It becomes a spot where record companies want to showcase the hot new upcoming band. Well, and also we were, I was booking right. great bands. Yeah. Bands were getting like, it, oh, was, yeah. a Shooter little, Jennings it was a band. little bit of a rehash. Right. It wasn't a scene like what the scene was in the late 80s. Yeah. But it, it, was, it was happening. It was happening. Everybody came. All of a sudden it wasn't just rockers. It, like we, that thing I've done before, and I'm sure I'll do it again, yeah. you turn the key and it just goes. You yeah. Know, it's wild. And you're so, right. Everybody I, wanted to play it. Everybody. everybody. Yeah. So every every famous rock star got up and played with that band. You name it, they played with them. All of them. They would get up there and do a, a song with them, and it'd be each night. It'd be like, oh my god, Ozzy's down here. Tom Morello's fucking, playing drums on yeah, this. You yeah. know, Jerry Cantrell's doing his yeah. own song. Like it would do. It was so. And because rockers, they needed a place. They didn't hadn't had a place forever. They hadn't had a place. A lot of those rockers didn't go to Ricky and Tammy's um, Pretty Ugly. Right. They didn't go to that. That was a very sceny, great club with great bands. But people didn't go to that. That club yeah you know but but everybody came up to the viper on the sunset strip for this club i remember specifically the night kings of leon played camaro they had the ep out and they were playing before metal school metal shop or whatever and they played like five songs and blew the roof off the place and i was like this band's gonna be fucking huge that's all i kept thinking you're literally jogging my memory because i'm now just remembering that, that oh was. oh dude i remember because the bass player looked like he was 14 and he had a giant bottle of jack daniels on top of his ampeg amp and he was hitting on it and they were known as like the southern strokes this is going to be the strokes but they're like southern rock and they had had this song wicker chair they had an ep out four songs and i was like this fucking band is god and then shooter's band was playing yeah, star played gun all, star gun they oh, played all they the just time just murdered it all the time there was a lot of really great bands you oh know, dude of, and like duff would have a side project yeah they, or not even he, it wasn't a side project then it was his project right duff would play steve jones's bands and play P. everybody played that night man dude I'm, let me tell you something i've yeah. done a lot yeah i was super proud of that yeah because that came from nothing that was like a four person lesbian failure by night two. That thing was gonna go away. Yeah. You know, and then and then they got a little big for their britches and they wanted more money and, and Sal couldn't afford it. I remember so that. I went and talked to Nick Adler at the Roxy and Nick, this is what they want. Nick's like, yep, everyone, everyone wanted this act. Right. So now we took it to the Roxy. Yeah. And then they got so big that criminal the guy that ran the key club, I'll leave his name out of it, but that criminal, <laughs> he paid him 10 grand a night. 10 grand a night. Every Monday. Whoa. So now we moved to the key club. Yeah. And it's funny, my friend Rick, who was head of security there, that was my dorm, that was my doorman at Granville. Yeah. Like, you know, it's once again, it's still in the ecosystem of yeah. rock and roll in Hollywood. That yeah. I, that's, that's my, that's my spine. Yeah. So, you know, I'm back home with like my friend Rick. So I'm, 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 I'm like, it, it was a great feeling. Now it's a big, huge stage and I'm I'm doing my fake air guitar and my like my singing along karaoke to all the rock songs before the band went on once again everyone just followed us yeah and then House of Blues right and they House of Blues did I, I did that then they went back to Key Club right. I did that and then by that time it was just I was done but yeah. I did 11 and I did it for 11 and a half years I mean there's nobody that can say they did a, a Monday night for 11 and a half years I remember uh, Tammy went on tour he had Jamie uh, his drummer no, the guy Jamie Scrap deep fill in DJing for oh. Camaro. Oh, and then, Jamie, of course. Yeah, and then he broke his arm, and he goes, hey, dude, can you fill in and, and DJ? And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be DJing at Camaro. But then he just fucking, like, one-handed, and I was like, damn. But I sat in that God, DJ booth. I haven't thought booth. about Jamie in a minute. Jeez. Yeah, I sat in that DJ booth every Monday night. That's I sat the on back the, corner of the in the viper. back corner and watched that fucking thing every Monday night in my leather pants and my fucking... <laughs> but, dude, that was... that you. Could meet your little rockers the there. In the very beginning, it was like old dudes with conch belts and the cowboy boots <laughs> and frizzy hair. It was like every bad guy from the country club in Her metal tumbleweeds. Yeah, man. It was yeah. those guys from the old country club gigs for like, you know, uh, yeah. bang tango gigs at the country club in yeah. 89. Yeah. So so I, I, to watch it evolve was shocking, man. Like, I became Hollywood hipster. There was a lot of the Malibu uh, oh, rich yeah, kids yes, and all yes, that yes. stuff. You Evan know? Ross. Like, all, all, yeah, no, everybody, no. everybody came. 
Yeah. Everybody came to that, you know, because it was the it was the off thing you could do, and plus it was me. So it's like you, you had all your drinks, you get the best table, like you know, it was it was so fun. And I and and then what happened is from there, that's when Hart and I started our company called the Alliance, which for you know the next ten years dominated LA nightlife. Plus we had like big marketing contracts with you know Heineken, yeah. and Cadillac, and all these Red Bull, and you know. I, we started doing those big money events. Were you guys doing Camp Freddy? Were you in charge no, of that? No, no, no. The, the, this was, the Alliance was clubs, but it was also more like uh, PlayStation wants to do a big launch and they needed to be this crowd. Right. So they'd, the people that were building it would come to us and we'd be like, okay, you know, give us the guest list. We'd invite all our friends, all our famous friends, all the girls, and we'd have this sick party and like 50 Cent would play or, right. you know, like, but that I've was, been to those. That like, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was played. years into it. The yeah, right. yeah, was ours. Yeah. The Interpol one was ours. Yeah. The 50 Cent one was I ours. I went to those. We did a million of them. We did them with Pharrell. We, we did a million of those. Yeah. And that, that was that was kind of my gig. And then Hart and I just, we turned the screw and we got this big deal at the Roosevelt and we had Teddy's and we had the pool. And then we did our first kind of big bottle banger, which was Mood. Yeah, Mood. So that that was like 03, 04, 05-ish, something in there. It all runs together now. But, you know, so if I, if I started... If I did the whole Steel Panther Metal School Metal Shop thing started in 2000, by 0102, like the alliance is firing and now it's clubs and events and marketing and like, you know, I was really super successful and, you know, created my own corporation and all this stuff that like I'd never imagined. Yeah. It was like a nickel and club club was like a nickel and dime side venture. <laughs> this is like a real venture. Like, whoa, okay, I gotta get like a real accountant and I gotta like yeah. a corporation and I gotta it, I, I was such a novice at it. But you know, I cut my teeth and learned a lot and and built that brand really strong and then, you know, withstood all the intense changes in the nightlife business because in the nightlife business it used to be a couple players and all of a sudden, man, there was there was a, there was a mandate in Hollywood. They gave anyone and their mother a liquor license. So now all of a sudden, there's a million operators. And you know, at the end of the day, if there's 80 people trying to do what you do as opposed to 10, yeah. it's going to be harder and more cutthroat. And granted, no one had what we had. Getting back to like Ledoux and you know, that's now we're talking about 08, 09. Yeah, we're Ledoux. About 07, 08, 09. Like all these clubs, like no one could do it as well as us. But if there's a million people doing it, when all of a sudden we're taken from, there's only yeah, so many people. This pretty girl rolls up and she's like, oh, "Who you with? Oh, these two guys. Nah." Yeah. So she's gonna take her two guys and go somewhere else. Yeah. They didn't used to have it like that. Yeah. You had to. They would leave the dudes outside. Yeah. And although people still do that, they, you know, the the preciousness of it eroded right and that's, right that's fine it happens in every business so i can't complain because we are still super successful even to the even to the last run with you know we brought on frankie delgado who was a kid that was on the hills and he was starting to promote and he was doing really well and he was knocking the pants out of the bigger promoters in the same buildings he was at and he's like i want to work with you and i was like if you work with these people you can't work for us so yeah. when he finally decided he didn't want to work for them anymore he came and worked with us and he was so great and you know the truth is in the next seven to ten years turned him into the linchpin of the business and wow. up until corona like hollywood nightlife the the fulcrum of that is frankie delgado so and that's my family i mean he's you know one of wow. my son's godfathers in my family but but you know the the uh, to, i think my longevity in night world is shocking oh you've been in the nightclub life 20, for 20 years it's fucking unheard of yeah unheard of let me ask you this. Do you believe that Studio 54 invented the red rope? Is that where it started? I mean, people give Mark Beneke, who mm. was the doorman there, who later did Bar One here. Yeah, Bar One. Do you remember 1990? Yeah, totally. So M Mark, but I mean, he wasn't the first person to do it, but I think Studio 54 will always be like the ultimate red rope. Sure, the ultimate right. velvet rope. Right. Yeah, I mean, there's no point in trying to nitpick about it. Like, it's Not the ult it's the ultimate club ever. The ultimate, and he it was the ultimate door ever, and he he was the ultimate that doorman thing. And I always wonder whatever happened to Mark. Um, yeah, I heard he's still alive, which is great. But yeah, he he pulled that same thing at Bar One, 1990, over there where yeah. where those clubs are now. So. Um, uh, uh, I remember that was me and Rick used to go to that, and like we had a way in, but like you still had to kind of like look and like make you know like, oh. you had to do that little game. And I'm not I'm not a person that's usually doing that game. Yeah, and, you know we it was never a problem there, but like you know it was it was a thing. You had to kind of fight your way to the front and kind of make sure your face got seen. And and yeah, I would say that yeah, 54. For sure. Did you ever have anybody try to attack you because you wouldn't let them in around the red rope? I mean, I became pretty deft at at kind of. Uh, not removing myself, but you know, there's always dormant insecurity. Yeah. So what I had to learn to do was not engage. Right. Because you you say to people, hey, dude, it's a nightclub, man. Don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. 
Yeah. Like, it's just a nightclub. Fuck you. The worry was like, you'd, you know, you'd see these rotten people at the Grove and you're like trying to like go to a movie. And they're oh, like, shit. hey, you're the guy who don't live in club. And you're like, yeah. oh, no. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I've been, I'll knock on some wood. I've been real fortunate. Whoa. I also think I'm a smart guy. Like, I can say, hey, dude, I've, I've gotten into that dialogue. I was like, hey, dude, this is my job. I know yeah. that it's a nightclub to you. Yeah. But you and your seven horrible dudes. That If I had a club full of you and your seven horrible dudes, I wouldn't be here doing this. Yeah. It's my life. There'd be no one in there. So why don't you want to buy a table? Do you want to um, come back next week with a bunch of girls? I got you. Like whatever, whatever the stupid, yeah. you know, algorithms are. But like, you're not. You're also dealing with people that are wasted. You're dealing with people that you know. It's it, ultimately, you, if you get back to the notion, is you're throwing a party. Yeah. When you throw a party, your party are for your friends. So I know that I don't show up to a party that's I'm not invited to, or I'm not going with someone who's got who's invited. Yeah. It's just kind of. So nightclubs, I know it's not like that, but like it really is like that. Yeah, you're, you know, guys would say, well, I'm like, or how about this, girls too? Well, who invite? You know, the doorman will say, who invited you? Uh, we just uh, making up something, lying, some see. You know, once social media came, they thought they knew what they could say. Yeah, prior to social media, they were kind of screwed. But once you have social media and you have all these kids working and, and posting, oh, I'm invited by so and so. Okay, yeah. well, have them text me. Yeah, you know, but then they're just mad. They're just ultimately, I think in life, if someone tells you no, you're mad. Yeah. yeah. So whether it's an audition, whether it's getting into a club, whether it's hey, do you like my band? Can we get a demo deal? Remember a demo deal? Demo deal. And then there's a record deal. Like yeah. if someone tells you no, you're mad. Yeah. So if part of the art of doing nightclubs and not having a horrible party inside that people will want a good one that people want to come back to, and not a horrible one that no one wants to go to, is you have to learn how to say no. Yeah. And yeah. why? Yeah. And then not get caught in the whole fake bullshit shit discriminatory thing like they just say anything and yeah. then they think they can say it and then put it on yelp and say whatever they want because in the world now you don't have to have earned anything to say something all you have to do is have a phone that happens to have charge in it you're and right you get to say whatever you're the right fuck you're, you right. Want. you're you right know? and it's bullshit man like like we were mad at the record labels but the truth is the record labels and the radio stations even though there was a lot of corruption they were arbiters yeah they fed us some crap, but they fed us all the shit that we love. That's the fabric of our life. So once we once this once we don't have that anymore, Spotify's dope. But you're your own record label on Spotify because it'll give you things that are akin to what you like. But like ultimately, I miss the days when the record labels mattered. Yeah. Honestly, I miss the days when radio I, mattered. I did too. Rock and roll managers who are our friends will tell us that it matters to their bands, but it really doesn't matter that much anymore. No. You're not gonna have a big. Hit. Are you gonna have a big hit on the radio? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I guess. But like at the end of the day, you want you want that song on a TV. TV show now. You yeah. want that song. TV show. You want that song. You know, Commercial. So so I, I miss the old arbiter. And with our parties, we have to be the arbiters. So. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, you managed uh, Elijah Blue's Dead oh, Sea. Yeah, yeah, man, yeah, keys, major keys to the uh, Gram key to Gramercy Park. I, it's so funny because I co-wrote that song with him. Uh, you want to hear something funny? I lived a block from it in New York, and every day I walked by that fucking park on the way to the Comedy Cellar, it would hit me. I got the keys key to, to the Gramercy Gram Park. Park. I love it. Dude, it hit me every day. You're you know? such an interesting sort of. Um, shadow walk with me through so much a i didn't realize we're the same age yeah uh, but it's, well, we, it's we, so we, interesting because like when you showed me that picture of you and hexel at bordello which yeah. later became my club granville you, you know there were a lot of people around but you know in, in general i would know them right or they don't last or they move back to where they came from you know i remember the kid that lived with with tammy was a kid called sam phillips he was the dj at uh the the mud the mud wrestling Oh, yeah, at where, the Tropicana. Where Vince met yeah, yeah, Sharice. Yeah. Sam was the DJ. Sam yeah. was like a G of... Uh, and then, you know, he was Tammy's roommate. So yeah. he was like crushing in the clubs. And I remember he tried to have a band, like every, like Axel's brother and everyone else, uh, Ricky Rackman, everyone tried to have a band. And, 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 you know, a guy like Sam, who was in my life like every day for a lot of years and was like a good friend, you know, they go back to Florida and you just never hear from him again. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know, I get it. And it's yeah. not painful, but it's it's like... You know, mostly that's what it is. It's not mostly. In fact, even less is with a guy like you who was there. We didn't really know each other. Yeah. But yet as, as everything filters away, it's funny how it all comes back around. Oh, yeah. Well, it really weird was you and I end up doing a TV pilot together. With Fred. Fred. And Davey yeah, Arquette. Yeah. yeah. And, and Davey Arquette man, uh, uh, directs it. And I'm thinking like. I've known this motherfucker right That's here. That's so crazy. Yeah. Dude. It really is crazy. I mean, I'll tell you how crazy it is. There's a, somebody sent me a video about six months ago, and they said, is this you? 
And I looked at it, and he had slowed it down and chopped every frame. And it was me and Axel at the Rip party. And downtown? No, uh, at the Palladium. Downtown oh. was that when they played. And we stage dived together during, I think it's Alice in Chains is on, or Temple of the Dog. Yeah, Sorry. Alice in Chains was at the downtown. Yeah. And, and I'm like, whoa, what the That's fuck? That's crazy. Yeah, I'm like, I can't, like, yeah, we, we fucking said, let's do it. And we stage dived in, you know, but, but that's what I'm saying. It's like, there's this era of it's so like burning up and everything. Uh, and it, most of it burns away and you're not yeah. left with a lot. Yeah. So I'm, I'm super glad that you're still here. So there we are. And thriving, yeah. Across from each other doing a pilot together. Yeah, and I, and I at the time had no idea. Now we got off because we laughed and we had fun and you, you weren't like trying to beat me over the head with where you were and what you knew. No. And, and so it also makes for a pretty great dialogue today because, you know, a lot of that stuff I just didn't know. And yeah. even when you, like, right before we started, you showed me that picture. And I'm like, yeah. he looked, the truth is, you look like Stuart Bailey right there. Oh, yeah, yeah totally. That's what totally. you look like. I mean, yeah. he's bigger than you, but like. Yeah, or Wes Arcane, yeah, you know. Yeah, thing. You yeah, know? yeah. So when you ask about Elijah Blue, it's so interesting. I had met this kid who was 12, his Cher's son and Greg Allman's son. And he and a kid called Balthazar Getty. Yeah, were, who I just had on the podcast. Oh, you did. Balt's yeah. great. Purple yeah. House. Yeah. Balt's a, he's great a, shit. Balt is a creative force. Oh. Balt's fantastic. Dude, his clothing uh, line and no, his, shit. And his art. I was oh, at Chrome Hearts art. the other day in the factory, and there's a piece there that Balt made that's American flag out of rags and the Jewish stars. And I mean, Balt is fucking, crazy dude, he's fucking talented. great, man. He's Shout good. out to Balt. Yeah. So, I pushed him a little bit. He got like, a, look, man, no, I'm not a fucking rich kid. I'm like, well, you kind of are. Listen, it's fine yeah. to be a rich kid, but you know, other than yeah. a lot of rich kids, yeah. he's doing something with it. Totally. You know, Casey Washerman's That's a what rich I was kid trying too, but Casey Washerman balls out. Yeah. You yeah. know, so. That's what I was trying to tell him. I go, look, dude, I'm just saying. It's pride. Yeah. You know, yeah. It. Fuck yeah. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with Got his clothing. It's great. No like one needs to apologize for having, having had a, a leg up. No, not at all. Yeah. It doesn't no. make it less valuable. Yeah. So I met these kids, they're like 12. They're like wide-eyed, bushy-tailed bushy kids. There's a very famous thing that now that I realize, you'll probably remember this. If you tell me you were there, yeah. it'll be a different story. Yeah. There was this lunatic from New York who had made a ton of money and had moved out to L.A. and created a persona, and he called himself the Colonel. The Colonel. And he lived up in Benedict Canyon. And in 1988, I was dating Katie Wagner, and her half brother Josh Donnan was with Cher and Cher lived across the street in right. the famous house that Eddie Murphy later lived in and Katie's like this crazy guy is going to throw this Halloween party and uh, uh, you know you, you got to meet him we're going to go over there now what I didn't realize we were going over there this dude was handing us a bag of ecstasy yes <laughs> okay so we walk in he's, oh nice to meet you he's like this kind of roly poly guy with a horrible swoop comb over yeah. but like he was very fun and nice and you know before YouTube he had like this crazy archive of, of rock videos that no one had he had he had the, the rock and roll circus stuff with the Stones and the Beatles he had all this stuff that you, you could never see he had cocksucker blues yeah. he had all this stuff so that was like one of his things like I got all this no one's got this stuff you know it was pre-YouTube right? right so like he would have parties where he would show this stuff to people who had never seen it and you know we became fast friends he was a huge sports fan he had a satellite dish You're the first guy who had a satellite dish to get all the football games and the direct feed so you hear the announcers talking during the commercials yeah. at the big screen and the four screens around it and i'm like this guy is kind of this guy's fantastic so and he's partying like a crazy person he's rich he's driving a ferrari testarossa he's buying everyone drugs he's he's taking everyone to every concert and he's like you know he's retired essentially yeah. he's rich and he wanted to live that life and more power to it so and he played he had a tennis court he played tennis with josh don and so he hands case uh katie and i a big bag of ecstasy yeah and he's having this halloween party and in the course of it he's telling this kid who comes over all the time Cher's son, Elijah Blues, 12. Yeah. He's telling about me. I work with Guns N' Roses. Actually, I hadn't even, wasn't even working with Guns N' Roses then. I was just friends with them. And he's like, Josh, this and that. And, you know, I met this little kid. Me and Elijah still call it the chipmunk period because he's looking like a freaking chipmunk. And he has this big Halloween party. Elijah comes to the Halloween party as Slash. Later on, I introduced the Colonel to Perry Farrell. And then the girl I was seeing at the time, Inger Laurie from the Nymphs, who was like the hottest band ever. Right, yeah. And they were all from that scene. And so... It comes down that he wants to have a big party. This is now a couple of years later. And he wants to have Jane's Addiction play his house. Wow. And I got on the, I put the whole thing together. Yeah. And I have a, a couple of years later, I have a girlfriend in New York. I put the whole thing together. Jane's Addiction plays this guy's house. Whoa. Okay. And I'm in New York, like in a studio apartment with my dingbat model girlfriend missing oh. it. 
Wow. The worst case of FOMO I've ever had in my life, bar none. Yeah. I have the t-shirt still, Ritual De Lo Colonel. Whoa. Okay. Um, and, That's and, some Hollywood and, shit. I love it. No, but everyone, this is why, like, everyone knows about this party. Yeah. So I wouldn't have been surprised, like, oh, yeah, I knew or I couldn't go. But anyway, so he then does it again, I like, like, the next year with the Chili Peppers. And this time I'm there. And, you know, Elijah's now a few years older. And Elijah's, like, back and forth to boarding school. But he's always, we're always talking about music. Right. You know, this kid is, this kid has obviously fantastic music coursing in his veins. But, you know, he don't play music like Greg Allman. And obviously he don't play music like Cher. He's right. got ideas. He's right. got, like, he's got revolutionary. He wants to string his guitar a certain way. He wants it to sound a certain, he has all, and, he, and for years, I'd see him and all he would talk about was, I go, well, dude, let's hear the songs. Let's hear the this. Let's hear the that. Finally, he goes off to boarding school. He comes around and, and he comes back again. And he's like, you know, I, I want to make a demo. He get, I say, well, there's a guy called Josh Abraham who's now become yeah, Josh Abraham. Yeah, of course. But at the time, he had like done a demo for a human waste project. Oh, yeah, I loved her. Amy, Remember her? Amy she and, was cr- killer. Amy and Jamie, yeah. Amy was fire. So he had what done, happened to her? She's around. I see her sometimes. She was fucking, I think she's still with Jamie. Dude, she was great. The drummer played the hi-hat way up here. Oh, my God. So, so uh, I, I say, you should go see this guy. He'll make you a demo. He's doing some good demos. I call Josh. Hey, Elijah Boo's going to... Elijah Boo gets the money, not from his mom, but from Richard from Chrome Hearts. Oh, yeah. And, and I think Josh overcharges him. Mm. And they make the demo for Deadsy. Wow. And, 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 and the part that I guess I'm leaving out is, is Elijah and I spent a lot of time in my house, you know, smoking a ton of weed and, and you know, he's super into typo negative at the time. Right. He, he hipped me to them, actually. Well, that, that, was, the, that was a hot sound, he, too. He, yeah, I mean, he, he wanted that super slow, super deep, heavy. But I started playing him Sisters of Mercy, yeah. Gary Newman. Er, earliest David Bowie, all the early Bowie records, you know, Man Who Sold the World and Hunky Dory. I'm playing him, you know, I played, I remember playing him, it was like a seminal moment. I played him Black Country Rock. I played him the video of Gary Newman from the Erga Music War where he does Down it. in the Park in that chair. Love it. I played him Sisters of Mercy and like, I, it's crystallizing in his head and like there's this thing, it's brewing. And so, and I remember it to the day and I still have the lyrics somewhere on some bad, like maybe Sunset Marquee like tablet we wrote, we were almost on, we were on the phone together. Yeah. We basically wrote Flowing Glower, like the first, dead, well, there's another one we joke about. We call, it's called Limos and Tall Chicks, Never Made. There's a famous thing we made, and it's called the, the, the Josh, it's called the Living Room Tape. Yeah. Because I had a tape recorder, and I took his Les Paul, which was now strung with this crazy like, piano strings, and we play Flowing Glower and Limos and Tall Chicks and Down in the Park. And I have the tape. Yeah. And he that it, that elaborates into the, the Dead Z demo, which which he does a Cure cover, and uh, maybe not on the demo, but he does it for the first of the record. He it, it gets to Seymour Stein, who signed the Ramones and M- Talking Heads and Blondie, or maybe not Blondie, the Ramones, Talking Heads and Madonna. Right. He's like the greatest, coolest A and R guy ever at Sire, and Seymour Stein signs the band. Wow. In like, in like, yeah. And, and like, probably just like, off the demo. Just off the demo. The other, never played. Right, right. And then there was a litany of trauma, which I won't bore you or your audience with. And Elijah, the, the, you know, every, all, all the cool magazines, like, next greatest band, next thing. You know, they got this crazy look. They look like the kind of the club kids yeah. in New York and the yeah. 90s. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Club USA. Like, they yeah. Had this crazy, they had a killer like, look. They had this crazy look. They, they create their own Masonic alphabet. They just, it's, it's, it's a modern kiss. Yeah. With the heaviest guitars you've ever heard, but keyboards and beautiful melodies. It's really to this day, it's still completely groundbreaking. The right. band is deadsy. So, so after getting ping pong back and forth and not coming out, he he realizes like I got to get my record back. And this this to line it back up with what we've talked about. This is ninety end of ninety nine, early two thousand. I'm going through a bad breakup. I, I Granville has ended. I'm kind of like Ugh, haven't even started. What you call Camaro. it? Camaro. Haven't even started no, that yet. Yeah. So it's a small window of time. And and he calls me, he's like, I'm coming home. Looks like I can get the record back. Uh uh we got we got you know, I, I gotta play a show, gotta get a deal. And like he was like enlisting me, you know, whereas like I'd helped him a lot. It wasn't a thing where like I was gonna he was doing what he was doing. So but you know, he needed a manager, really. So it's like I I'd never envisioned myself making videos for the biggest band in the world. I never envisioned myself managing a super intense rock band, but like it just made sense at the minute. I had the, I had the, I had the, 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 the hard drive space to like really devote all everything I knew to it. And I knew And you loved it. I, and I, well, not only did I love it, I was part of it. Like, yeah. like 
I was part of it. I co-wrote the seminal song. I well, yeah, I co-wrote that song lyrically with him. I co-wrote Gramercy Park with him. Right. Like, like, Deadsy would have been Deadsy without me. Yes, but like, it, it, it literally, it. I coursed through it. He, he, and Ren and the rest of the guys, they took it where they where it belongs to be. But like, I mean, I was part of it. It, it made sense. So we, he gets the record back, and we plan a show. We start rehearsing band is heavy live like it's powerful and but they, but they've still basically never played yeah they so, never played so and, and and you know jonathan davis from corn when they got signed the first time wanted to sign them right and instead of that him and josh and jay gordon who had played bass yep jay louie he had played orgy. bass. they went and just started orgy and I sold know. a million records on a cover song yeah but like that was supposed to be deadsy's spot right so now 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 jonathan is like well okay I want to sign the band. So Deadsy cutting through. I mean, the stories are this. We could do an hour on Deadsy. Yeah. But so we, the story, the, uh, we play the show at the, at the, at the Viper. You know, I call Sal. You know, this, this is going to be nuts. Like, everyone's wearing the white chain, the white chain link that we all wore. Like, yeah. It, it, the, it was nuts. Every rock star in town was there. Every label was there. We had our friends, one of our friends, Brandon Davis, who's now like Brandon Williams, sorry, is one of the biggest real, real estate guys in the town now. He was just a punk kid then. He and another friend of ours were holding up a sign in front of the curtain before as the guards with the white face mask that says for sale. I still yeah. have the sign. Yeah. And Deadsy plays their first show ever and has 10 label offers. Everybody's losing their mind. Right, right. Everybody's losing their mind. And, and we end up signing with DreamWorks. Wow, DreamWorks. Yeah, and because, well, ironically, uh, David Geffen's last supposed heterosexual relationship was with Cher. Wow. So Elijah Blue, who's had Val Kilmer as a fake dad. Well, he has Greg Allman as a, Greg Allman as a real dad, yeah. who was never there. Yeah. He has Val Kilmer as a fake dad. He has Gene Simmons as a fake dad. He has Tom Cruise as a fake dad. Tom he Cruise. Has, he has the Bagel Boy as a fake dad. And he has had uh, uh, David Geffen as a fake dad. Unreal. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's real. So, you know, he's like, well, I mean, at least if we sign there, if we ever get in trouble, yeah. we can Called Dave, right, right. So, so, and and at one point we did, but th this, this, this a lot. By the way, so Deadsy happened right when the Rock Club happened, and the Alliance, this thing that I did for twenty years, that was so lucrative and fantastic, and you know I'm proud of. This all happening now at once. I go from a guy who has no idea what's going to happen to all these things at once, and I'm managing a band, and like you know, in, in that world, if you haven't managed a band before, people try to kick you around. And I remember what that was like. If you haven't been the head of video production for the biggest band in the world, people try to kick you around. If you haven't managed a band before, people try to kick you around. And I'm not saying cr why me, but like around the around his backside everyone's going like you need a real manager you need a real oh manager. yeah you know oh, yeah. so and, and by know. the way we tried You're right bino who's the best manager on the planet in rock and roll pretty much at this point right he's got system and alice and pumpkins and afi and you name it and the deftones i mean you name it i'm begging him and mark to, to manage the band with me and mark loves it he, he, at the time, was managing Taproot and had brought them in. And we ended up touring with Taproot because they loved it, too. But Bino just, like, wouldn't, couldn't, couldn't get his head around it. And, so, you know, and, you know, John Davis, who loved me, was also, but still was kind of telling Elijah, you know, you need a real manager. His managers, Jeff Qantas and Peter Katzis, yeah. they wouldn't do it. Peter Katzis. My guy. Yeah, yeah. Pete, still talk to him every day. He's got killer Zeppelin photos. He took photos yeah, of Zeppelin in 75. They're fantastic. They're like, in his garage. I'm no, like, they're actually in his living room. Oh, I'm like, dude, I no, need yeah, Pete, Pete, Pete's in it. You should do this with Pete. I know. Pete should be on your show. Yeah. That's a great one. Yeah, he's so, crazy. So, so they wouldn't do it. Yeah. So it's like, I just kept moving forward. I just kept making things happen and, you know, making shit happen. And the next thing you know, like elementary john's label john davis from corn it's dreamworks elementary right. so we're now we now our first tour besides the little tour that went that static x took us on and some papa roach we did a little dates but our first big tour is family values in the arenas whoa six weeks after 9 -11. wow wow you're know, like we're in washington dc during the anthrax we leave the lax airport there's national guard with rifles at the airport when we leave to go on our first tour wow and and you know the truth is desi sold a hundred thousand records out the gate with no radio play fred durst made the video the video is fantastic yeah the key to gramercy park and it really should it was like a primer for the band the band is like kiss it's outfits and it's each person has a character and it's a whole alphabet and it's all this crazy stuff and bands great bands loved us right 
all the great bands loved us. But I think radio is mad if you're a son of a famous person. Yeah. And this guy's got two of the hugest rock stars ever as parents, and people just weren't trying to help him. Yeah. Well, meanwhile, the band, the press loves him. The bands love him. Everyone loves him. And the band is so freaking crazy and heavy and amazing. One song sounds like a weird 80s pop Nagel photo. The other song sounds like, you know, straight up death metal. Yeah. Like, like, and it all worked. And the kids were, I, all the bands that took us on tour from Taproot to the Deftones to, you know, Chino always loved the band. And, and the Taproot guys loved the band. And, and John Davis, obviously, they took us on tour a couple times. Static X loved the band. Like the people that loved us, would they'd pull up to their own show. I remember pulling up in Chicago to the Metro on tour with Taproot. And Taproot was pretty hot at the time. Dude, out front was 50, 60 Deadsy kids. Wow. Now, it doesn't mean we were bigger than them. It just means right. that everywhere you would go, you'd feel stoked for taking this band on tour because they got real fans who were like dressing up in the outfits and the characters. And like we were doing, you know, I was hugging fat kids in parking lots in the freezing cold in Kansas. And like, yeah. you know, like that's, that's what we did. Whether it was arenas, which we did a few, theaters, clubs, we did it all with our 32 inputs in tiny club stages. <laughs> and like, I got to tell you, I never worked harder in my life. I got more out of it that I could ever imagine, except there was no money to be made. Right. Know? And it doesn't mean, and by the way, it only stopped after the second cycle. We put our second record. First record came out in 02, second record in 06. But, you know, it, it petered for its own reasons, whether it's drugs and other stuff. And, you know, Elijah, although infinitely talented, was not prolific. It took him four years to put out the next record. Right. So, GNR style. He's a mad scientist, you know. Yeah. He's a mad Yeah, but GNR had the success. If we had had that success, that's right. fine. That's a we good, didn't. Yeah, it's a good time off. Then people don't forget you. Yeah, yeah, we didn't. So I think the band probably would have been had a better chance of being more successful and kind of keeping the, the wheel turning had the record had another record come out within a year and a half. Right. Um, because there was a fervent audience for it. Um is he still around? Not only is he around, yeah. Deadsy's making music again. Wow. Yes, Deadsy's making music again. The music is fantastic. It's everything that you would imagine for Deadsy. Um he's making music. He and Ren they they talk, they make music. You know, it, it, there will be something Deadsy. The difference is is you know in in 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002. Yeah. You had street teams and you had all the, you had so much stuff that could like prop up a band. Right. Now people say, well, now you have SoundCloud. Well, they're past SoundCloud. Yeah. And, 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 and I don't know what a wave of promotion and a wave of whatever would be like. You know, MTV doesn't play videos anymore. Like, you know, we were on MTV. I know. The video that Fred made. So I know. I don't, I don't really know what it will be like to create a groundswell for the band. But what I do know is Elijah will make music and it will be fantastic. Let's um, uh, Before we get out of here. Yes, sir. Two things. Uh, the cane. You've always had a cane since oh, I've, What's yeah. the cane? You and really, also, you, you've got this amber smell that you've always had that I've, I've always... It's definitely seen. not amber. Well, what is it? Um, I wear an oil. Uh, yeah, I wear oil, that too. Wearing, That's what I that love That I've been about. wearing my whole life. Right. right. That I literally straight got off Pat Mata from Community FK, who was like an older brother to me. Yeah. It's a dude who put me on to... He, between he and my sister, they pretty much put me on to everything cool on the planet. And I was yeah. a young kid who already had his own things that he loved and liked. I mean, the first single I ever bought was... Ballroom Blitz by Sweet. Love it. I think the first album I ever bought was Dreamboat Annie by Heart. Yeah. Um, and my sister put me on the Ramones and the B-52s and the Dead Kennedys. And it was, you know, so Pat's Oil, I, I, I don't even know if he still wears it. Yeah. Um, Does he make it or? N no. No. I don't tell anybody the one I wear either. Yeah. So, but, by the way, it's not a secret, but it's, right. but, you know, I don't talk about it. Yeah. But I have been wearing it since I'm 17. All my clothes smell like it. I'm known for it. I love that you bring it up because oh, yeah. you're old school. So of course you do. Yeah. Uh, as far as a walking stick, I mean, it, it's it's not that exciting of a story, really. I was. It's kind of this around the same time when I stopped wearing shoes. Yeah. Like, like just I, have I, something. I went. No, I went to London with my father. My father was doing some business, advertising, fun. Pat Mata was living in London. He was trying to have a new band. He was working with this guy called Graham who had worked with Bauhaus and Tones on Tail. Yeah. And they, it was, I think it was called Between the Eyes. And it was great. He was living in Camden Town in a, in a family's house who was on the dole. You know, you, in, in England, right? They put you on the dole and you deal hash. So like we're smoking hash. My dad is doing his work. I'm going to Kensington Market every day and buying the coolest shit ever. You know, that star shirt that Corgan wore, I wore that years before him. Wow. At Ken Market where he probably got his. Or he probably got his at Bel on Belmont in Chicago where he's right. from. But point is, is like, 
is Pat at that time who was always super into like the whole skinhead music scene. I mean, he's not a Nazi fascist skinhead, but like Pat was really into that look and that flavor and those bands, all those oi bands. You know, I was super into that. I mean, I'm, I'm a super hardcore punk rock guy right. at the core of it. Like I really am. And, uh, and so I see Pat and Pat's in like doc, steel toe docks, red, red laces, all white, everything and 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 little and red braces i mean yeah. he basically looks like a skinhead right so he's carrying a cane and i'm just not gonna lie to you like it was it was every day we were hanging out in england on this little trip i was on probably nine ten days we hung out a bunch and you know i don't think pat cared that much i would grab it so that was like my because i have a, I, like my friend bino the, the the rock manager right who i told you about for years bino's always kind of been that way so i see how people are with mine and i just it was just like a, it was just tactile. I enjoyed it. I was holding it. Um, I remember every day we'd be together. I was just carrying the cane, and it just seemed real natural. Wild, you know. I'm a, I'm a, I'm probably 19. Yeah, and and I think a little bit of the the, the mythos of it gets lost. Here. I remember coming home, and I remember a friend of mine named Angela giving me the eight ball. Oh, I remember now, the eight ball cane. Because here's what happened. Yeah. I think when I got home, I was really into it. And I, and I had something in my house. Like a shitty, like, some shitty weird, it was like an, almost like, not balsa wood, but like it was shitty. And I was carrying it. And very quickly in that time, Angela, who, by the way, another thing I did is she created this cool kids kind of teen people magazine called Mouth to Mouth. Only had two issues. I wrote for that magazine. Wow. This is another crazy thing I did. Um, her, her family, her father's the biggest literary agent in the world. So and she was like a scene star from New York. Anyway, she put this magazine together. I wrote for it. And she had given me for a present, she had given me the, the very first eight ball game. Man. And, you know, I just... I hadn't. I never touched cocaine after the age of nineteen. Right. So here I am carrying an eight, eight ball, ball cane. cane. And it was like eight ball, eight ball, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not your guy. Yeah. So and and I got to tell you, it just became a thing where it's really just a habit. It's really literally. That's cool. It's just a habit, and you're gonna laugh because I tell that to people. You know, over the years, what's up with that? What's up with that? It's your, it's your image. It's your style. It's your nuni. It's your blankie. You know, that's for everyone else, and I get it. I don't mind if people. Oh, the guy with the cane. I don't mind. I get it. Yeah. But they they don't understand that. For me, it was really just a habit. I don't smoke cigarettes. My addict friends say I'm not a drug addict. So I guess that was my habit addiction was just to have this thing with me. You know, always with me. It's like, cool. Oh, you ever forget it? I'm like, well, no, because if I got up, it would feel funny. Yeah. So like, have I left it somewhere once? May yes, but like, I get ten steps away and I go, wait, I gotta go back and grab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, big like, super stone guy like leaves it at Paquito Moss, like, and goes drives back down the hill and it's just sitting there. You know. So, and I've had some, I've had some close calls, but you know, never, never lost it. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. And it's it's funny, you know. Is that the same like one you've had for years? Or? Well, by the way, in Don't Cry. Watch Axel walk up to the grave with his name on it. Watch what he's carrying. Really? My cane that has the sticker on it that comes from, I forget what the sticker was from. It's either, a, oh, I think it might have even been a Funhouse sticker, which Chris has. Oh, that yeah. band was a band. Funhouse. One of the great bands wow. ever. Yeah. Anyway, watch the Don't Cry video. Watch him walk up to the fucking gravestone with his name on it. Yeah. And what's he carrying? My cane. Wow. So, you know, and I think, I think probably a lot of people have wanted to do it over the years, but to, to, I think to them it's like a thing for an hour and they forget it or they lose it or right. they, they hit someone with it by accident. Meanwhile, like, I don't hit people with it. You know, I don't forget it. I don't walk around with it out in front of me. I've been in every punk, Metallica, any pit ever with it. Like, you don't, can't take it from me. You know what I mean? I go on airplanes. Like, it's like, it's just... If, you, if it's a part of you, then it doesn't look like it's this thing that precedes you. Right. So for me, it's really just a habit. And the other day when I actually ran into you, I was with Matt Corral, who is the quarterback for Ole Miss. He was a kid from out here. He's right. the number one quarterback in the country. He's about to be NFL quarterback in a year. And he's a He great didn't seem that big. Like, he's 6'2". Man, he didn't seem like it, though. You go, you know? Well, I'll show him to you next year. You'll watch him play. He's a baller. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Matt was with his friend who plays with him, a young kid. A uh, kid from Florida who's gonna pl who plays with him in, in Mississippi, and we're walking in the car, and, and Matt was holding it like people like to hold it. You yeah. Know? First of all, I've been carrying it thirty years. There's a lot of juice in it, right? Yeah. So 
And this one, Bob Downey made me actually. This one I've been carrying about five or six years. Really? Made me by Bob Downey, yeah. Wow. Um, and you know, Alan Hughes has given them to me over the years. I mean, it's funny. It's people have given to me, and I don't carry them. And it's not like a, a thing. Oh, I didn't like it. It's just if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. Whatever. Right. right. And uh, and and we're walking in the car, and Matt was talking about it, and and his friend that was with him, this kid, look, young kid, he looks up at me and he goes, he goes, yeah, it was just a habit, right? And I got to tell you, Dean, it, 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 no one ever has said that to me. Yeah. No one. And yeah. when I say it to people, like they get mad at me. Yeah. And this young kid, I mean, fresh off the bus, was like, it's just like a habit, right? Yeah. I was like, wow. I was like blown away by that. Wow. So, so for me, yeah, it's it, you got the you got you asked, you asked. I have no problem talking about it. for a lot of years. I'm like, I, I would have I'll, answers, and you know, I wasn't like, of course. Why do you want to talk? Like, what, do, yeah. I would say, don't you have anything else to talk about? Like, I was a dick about it. Yeah, yeah. I just like it, it, I didn't. I didn't need it to. I didn't need it to be my image, my style, right, my, right. my blankie. Everyone else did it. That's fine. They still do. Totally cool. Even with my son, people are like, oh, I gotta get him a little light bulb cane. I'm like, absolutely not. Yeah, That's yeah. Not his problem. Yeah, you know what I yeah, mean? yeah, yeah. And it's funny because True loves loves my cane. And yeah. He, and sometimes, you know. Sometimes I should bring it to me or whatever. He loves it, but yeah, like that—that's me, and it'll—it'll it'll go away with me, and 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 yeah, it's really just a habit, and it's a habit. Maybe it's a grounding stick. Who it's good, knows? man. Maybe I needed it. Maybe when someone is about to roll someone on the street, and the guy with the stick is probably the not the guy you pick. Maybe it's kept people off me for years without me even knowing it. I don't know, but either way, it's 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 beautiful, and it carries a lot of uh, a lot of my energy. With me. My last thing to you. We've talked about the insanity of the rock and roll era of the 80s in Los Angeles and, and being in that. But I think one of the most insane things I ever saw in my life that I really couldn't understand and, and was in the middle of it and watching this would be Nikki, Paris, uh, Lindsay, mm. and that whole insanity of uh, that club world, man, and they became famous from going to clubs. Wasn't that insane to see? It's funny, you know, you're probably the, well, you're not the first person, and I think Lindsey Parker asked me about it a little bit um, on Sirius, and I thought that was cool, and I think it is cool, because it's, 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 it's less about Lindsey Paris and more about the culture. Right. Right? You know, there's always been people that got famous for, for either being a, uh, debutante or a son of somebody or a royal or whatever, right? They, they have some kind of nepotistic attache to fame. Um, the culture has now abandoned so much of what's actually accrued and real and, and, and earned. And that was, the, that was sort of the, the through the looking glass nexus point of when it all changed. Yeah. You know, Paris, okay, I'm going to take you back to this period we keep talking about. It's, year, it's early 2000. I'm fairly heartbroken at the time. I Deadsy thing is happening. This Monday night thing is happening. The alliance isn't happening yet. I'm, you know, whatever. And I and I hanging out with my friend Justin, and we're going to clubs that I would normally never go to. But I was like sad, and you know, I had to start like I, I had been in a relationship for almost three years, and I kind of had to get 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 uh get back on the horse. So Justin would come pick me up, and and. And he had this this pretty girl in the car, and she was kind of she was kind of she had like a funky style. Not she, like, she wasn't really overly cool, but she had a great attitude. And like we'd be like, get the drink. She'd go get the drinks. Like whatever. Like she was just fun. It was Paris. Yeah. And 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 so to watch that happen, and then, uh, and and to tie it in to something else, which is crazy. Who's her cohort? Nicole Richie. Yeah. Who was best friends with Nicole Richie and 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 a diehard early Desi fan. Elijah Blue. Right. Elijah Blue used to kind of half date Nicole Richie. Sometimes you wouldn't know where Elijah was for two weeks. He was holed up in the mansion at Nicole's mom's house. So now you have these two girls. I, I already know Nicole and I've come to know Paris and and my and, and then I start this my clubs and my my you know my brand with Hartwell. And all of a sudden when it's time to have these parties, of course Nick uh, Paris and her sister and Nicole are going to come to our parties. Right. To everyone else, it's like, oh my God. To us, it's like, of course, they'd, they'd be there anyway. Yeah. So it was really actually helped build our brand. I'm not going to lie. That whole thing that happened on my watch, I mean, dude, Ledoux, that yeah. outdoor patio Ledoux, we made half the money because all those tables are famous people. Right. The tables you could sell for a fortune, we couldn't sell because every famous person, Catino Mobley from the Clippers and Evan Ross needed this one and Lindsay needed that one and Paris and Nikki needed that one and Eve needed that one and you know Reggie Bush and Matt Leiner needed that one and everybody needed what they needed, right? Right. So, so to, 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 to have, I, let me tell you something. 
it was nothing like being a part of Guns N' Roses, Jane's Addiction, right. Dead Z, right. or, and, or, or anything else. Or, or like the, the movies and the stuff that were happening in the late 80s and 90s. Because that's all art. And, and art. even the grunge thing. When you know, My friend Alex moved from here. A kid I grew up with my whole life. One of my oldest friends in the world, Alex. He just got to town. He um, moved to Seattle. He built Rock Candy and all those bands made it out of Rock Candy. And the guy that I saw in Seattle and I was like, I got to get out of here and quit this. The only guy I saw, because Alex was out of town, was he sent his buddy that I had met when I was filming Jump Street three years before, his buddy Stone. Oh, wow. Gosser. Yeah, so Amazing. Stone rode his bike over to the hotel. Like We went to the, the Pike Street thing, and he kind of walked me around, and I was like, Stone's a great guy, but like Stone's not going to want to hang out with me every day for the next six weeks, and I'm going to be miserable up here. Yeah. And so uh, th th this... The grunge scene, the rock scene, all the, the punk thing that happened, all these things that happened before my very eyes, this thing to me yeah. was, was kind of corny. Honestly. Same to me. Same it to me. It was kind of corny. Like, I was just kind of like, wait, what have they done? Well, right. And, yeah. and by the way, but, but, but kids of rich people, yeah. they didn't need to. New York was filled with that. Oh, so yeah. I wasn't mad at it. No, I it wasn't either. It just wasn't exhilarating. Right. In fact, I got a lot out of it. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Paris was very loyal to us. They were all very loyal to us. You know, all of our clubs were filled with them all the time. So then again, all of like, so, you know, these, these, these people, you know, big draw me and my big partner, draw. we were assholes. We we're like, you, you want us to do your club? It's this much money. It's this. like, we, we were assholes Yeah. and, 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 and they had to do it because we had it all. Yeah. So we had everyone. And so I, the truth is, is I'm very grateful for it. I think it's culturally a disaster, but by the way, I ain't going to be mad because Nicole made something out of herself. Yeah. Paris made something out of herself. She's a cottage industry. And people talk shit about Paris to me. I'm the wrong guy. Because yeah. Paris was always nice to me. Always, you know, always would come to our stuff. When she had certain things that, you know, we, we would get hired to do that. Like, she was always super, super, I guess, you I mean, listen, they went everywhere. So it wasn't like they only went to our places. But like, I'm just saying, we could count on them. And, and you know, Paris never changed her tune. To, if I saw Paris today, she, it would be exactly how it was when she was that girl in the back of Justin's car. There's, now, a lot has happened, you know, and a lot, you know, all her stuff and the TV show and all. Even that TV show was nonsense. Right. They got famous for sticking their, their, their fist in a goat's ass. Like, I mean, like, <laughs> like whatever. But, but the truth is, is I'm grateful for it because it was really enormous for our brands and our clubs at the time. And the truth is, if those girls were assholes, if Paris was an asshole, I'd be saying something different now. But the truth is, is she's always been nice to me and always been the same person and i give her a lot of credit for that well you know what man uh i can't thank you enough for coming and doing the show i've never had a uh a guy like you on and uh it's what it, okay so now let me ask you what is a guy like me what am i well you're you're the real deal i, I mean i've had <laughs> a ton i've had a ton of real deals on i'm talking about somebody that was uh that i could talk to about stuff uh, other than band members right that was there and their, their perspective and stayed in it and didn't try to be somebody they weren't and real deal person. You know, whenever I see you, you'd be like, Del Rey, Dean Del Rey, what's up? You know, and it's, uh, it, it's just, and also I've, I've always been, um, you know, I've always been fascinated with the club scene. I've been in it for years and, and I, of course, uh, worship the, uh, the mystique of the Studio 54. So I never looked at the club stuff as cheesy either because I always knew that that's where shit happened. Period. Mo movie deals yes. would happen. Uh, you know, records w deals would be signed. Uh, fucking stars would be made in nightclubs, and man. And sometimes if, if the actual stuff didn't happen, maybe, but the, the thing that led to the thing late, it, right. it, it's all going down in the club. It and by is. the way, that goes from Joe DiMaggio or, or the gangsters in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Right. It goes all through time. Right. And let me tell you that people always say, I can't, you know, Josh, you could have done so much more. You could have been this. You could have been that. I'm always like, well, first of all, I am what I am, and I, it's not about what I could have been. And you did do a lot, and, 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 and you I, still and, are. And, 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 but the clubs, to me, the, the relevance of it, it's yeah. major. Oh. You know what I mean? Like, you, the athletes that I know, like, everybody goes in the club. Like, you yeah. know, we don't get to talk sports much because you're not a sports guy, but, like, you know, there's the most famous athlete in the world right now. The only club he goes to is ours. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like we know how to treat people. It's relationships. And, and the club, although, I, you know, I'm known. I'm outside. I'm not in the club getting my head kicked in. I don't drink. Yeah. I'm not in the club drinking. I just know how to do this. I turned it into a business. Right. I'm proud of it. Yeah. Really proud of it. Oh, it's fucking and great. And mysteriousness 
It doesn't debunk the mystery. It's just that I'm one of the only people that you'll ever could know who did it for 20 years into adulthood and isn't some like drug casualty or doesn't have like 19 bastard kids. You know what I mean? Like 18 failed marriages. Yeah. Like, I have a nice normal life. Uh, my friends are all grown and old. Some are super successful. Some, you know, broke ass. It doesn't matter. I have my same friends. Um, and the, the, club, the club has been an unbelievable jumping off point for things and security i think it's great because here's the bottom line why would you if you're famous you you hit a peak you do you get somewhere and now you want to go out unless you're a hermit and 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 celebrate everybody it, does yeah you want to go out you're i've like, seen it over the years shit, i fucking worked my ass off let's go out and fucking tear it up that's why the entourage tv show was so huge people gotta fucking look yeah, pe at that people want to see they always yeah. have you're right people yeah. they always have and by the way i turned down everyone you can think of who offered to do the show why haven't you do you need to do a show yeah. well because that's not fun for me no I don't care. no you don't you won't pay me enough money to ruin my life you're not going to cheesy up my shit now when the hills wanted to film me and Hart would take their money but they would have to film in a back corner not even in the club yeah you know what i mean you, you, they yeah. never ruined our club yeah fake shit yeah but, and it was cool it was good for the name and the brand but like they never we wouldn't let them ruin our party with their lights and their yeah. shit. never and you know and i'm grateful for the hills because i'm grateful for frankie you know i mean a covid of course is a fucking disaster oh it's a wrap yeah um i i i have not op i know what you're gonna say so yeah. i have not operated since march by the way yeah. our shit was so on fire with, even by at six and a half years or whatever i was sitting on a couch with eric dane who's my friend of 20 years jacob and zendaya all three of them from uh euphoria the hottest show on the planet. Yeah. They had just had their little the rehearsal dinner. They were about to start filming season two. And we were all sitting on my famous couch out front of Hyde. Or right. Like right inside the walkway of Hyde. And people were panicking seeing her. Because she's like the it girl now. And the show is so hot. And she's right. such a nice kid. And, and literally, like we were having as good of a night as we ever could have had. And by the end of the week, we were, that was it. And, and so like up until the very end, we were still knocking out home runs, right? Right. And, and I got to say like, do I want to get back to it? If it's there and it makes sense and the money's right and it all feels good, of course I'll get back to it. But man, I'll tell you this and we can close on this. I always would say over the years because I did it for so long, people are like, wow, you're still doing that? Or geez, geez, geez. And I would always say, I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. I went from being like an asshole about it going, I wish you'd stop coming. Then I don't have to do this shit anymore. Yeah. But I, the truth is I found out about seven, eight years ago how grateful I really was through a whole other course of events. And, and, and the truth is I used to say, well, you know, Stuff, man. I mean, I'm not saying it's hard work, but like the calendar never takes a Thursday off. The yeah. calendar never takes a Friday off. So, you know, it's a grind. Well, the calendar just took about a year off. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm you very grateful for being able to brand crispy rice and do some, you know, uh, all the all the delivery brands that our boss Sam has. And I've been grateful because it's been a great thing to do during COVID. But like back in the mix, like you said, and, and firing that back up again, you realize that nightlife world is all about momentum. Totally. So when you build something like Hyde Sunset and we crushed it for six and a half years and took on all comers and we're still like firing on 10 six and a half years later, which nobody can say to start up again would be to start up again. It's not a moment. There is no momentum. Yeah. Now, could we do it? Of course. Will, will we do it if, if all the particulars are right? Yes. But if you think about Gavin Newsom and you think about the state of California, it's a long time before they're going to let 500 kids go crazy in a club. Long time. So I have to, I have to exist in my life like, like that's not something that's happening. Yeah. Not because yeah. I don't want it to, just because I'm not going to go. There's other people we work with and y'all know who you are. <laughs> when? When? <laughs> Gotta get back. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm the opposite. I'm like, I'm enjoying hanging with my family. I'm enjoying hanging with my friends. I'm enjoying having the time to spend an afternoon like this, which we tried to do it a million times and we didn't do it. I know. So I'm so grateful for this. Honestly, Dean, this is a real treat because I get asked a lot and I don't. Oh. So I'm really glad to do I'm this. I'm so thing. glad you yeah, did it, I'm man. I'm really glad. I'm Thank so you. glad. And, and I it lives forever, which I love. Yeah. I can't thank you enough for doing the show. It's my and, pleasure. Uh, and let's, uh, let's get some tacos once a week or so. So we see each other over there at Tacos 1986. Well, we've got to get you over the hill on the Beverly. I'll come right over the hill. I'll go to the Beverly one in one minute. It'd There's no great, traffic We anymore. also should just be listening to music and like rocking let's out. Let's do that. And, yeah, let's man. do that. Dean, I thank you. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. Uh, once again, Josh Richmond. Let there Richmond. be good times. Let there be good times. <laughs>